ring the bell to a man in a Mercedes. Sound familiar? You still working for that rich guy? What did you say, Sonia? His voice stern. I denied everything. You know I wouldn't rat you out, baby. Sonia sat back and smiled. I covered for you, Matt. My coming here tonight proves how much I still love you. After unbuckling his belt and unzipping his fly, she stopped. I would do anything for you. Jury is out on that one. She ask about anything else? Yeah. This detective had a sister, Danielle, who got herself kidnapped and killed by some nasty sons of bitches. I heard about it myself on the news a while back. Does the name Danielle Montgomery ring a bell? With his brow furrowed, he stared through her for a long minute. His eyes glazed over. When he finally fixed on her again, he grinned. You know, I think I've missed you after all. Nudging her up, Rogan shoved his pants down his thighs, a part of his anatomy standing at full attention. After looking down at himself, he grinned up at her and handed over a condom. Take all you want of this. I'm feeling real generous. And if you do me good, I got plenty more. He lay back on the mattress and let her take charge, the way it had been, the way it would be again. Sonia had to free herself from the past, and unknowingly, Matt would play his part. He owed her that much. She crooked her lips into a faint smile and gazed down at him. She had special plans for Matt Brogan, and step one had gone off without a hitch. Chapter 11 it took most of the morning for Becca to track down Rudy Marquez. She knew he'd be at work and wanted one-on-one -on -one time with him without having to dodge interference from his brother, Father Victor. All she had was the name of a subcontractor he had worked for years ago. After countless phone calls, she found his current employer and the job site he would be at today. The timing worked. Nearly the lunch hour, the odds were good she might catch him on break. As she drove, Becca's mind pondered what she remembered about Isabel's brother. Many questions nagged her, leftovers from her session with him downtown at Central Station. His insinuations directed at Kavanaugh were top of her list. Becca would push him to see if his finger pointing at Kavanaugh had any merit. Yet she couldn't ignore the murder weapon being consistent with a mason's hammer, a tool of Rudy's trade, and the fact he had an arguable motive to kill his own sister and had worked the renovation project at the Imperial Theater didn't bode well either. No doubt, Becca had to keep an open mind about Rudy being a viable suspect, but would Kavanaugh make the cut on her persons of interest list? When Becca pulled up to the construction site, a small professional building off Loop 1604, she stayed in her car and scanned the workers for a familiar face. Most sat near the open tailgate of an old blue truck with a worn camper shell, eating their lunches and chatting it up. But Rudy wasn't among them. When she wondered if her trip had been wasted, she spotted a man off by himself, sitting under the shade of an oak tree. She recognized Rudy Marquez and headed his way. Sitting apart from the others, he wore faded jeans, a white t-shirt under an oversized blue chambray shirt, all of it covered in dust and sweat. His dark hair was mussed and hung over his eyes. Rudy looked lost, a real loner. She knew how it felt to live in a vacuum, a self-imposed prison. Despite how her heart went out to him, she had to set aside her personal feelings. Becca had made the mistake before, superimposing her own grief onto a young man who might be guilty of murder. She had a job to do, and Isabel deserved justice, even if it came at the expense of her brother. I'm not supposed to talk to you, Rudy said as she walked up. Sitting on the ground, his back against the tree, he stared at the horizon, barely acknowledging her presence. Although he hadn't greeted her with open arms, at least he hadn't waved an attorney in her face. She took this as a good sign. Why not? I'm only trying to find out what happened to Isabel. She knelt beside him, her eyes fixed on Rudy. Don't you want to know what happened to your sister? Becca picked up a clump of caliche and worked it in her fingers while she watched him. The chunk of soil, made white by its lime content, gave the ground a cement quality. With the construction, her jeans and hiking boots would be covered in a layer of its white dust before she left the site. In his own way, Rudy reminded her of Kalichi. Hard on the outside, but soft and pliable underneath when pressed, at least in theory. 
Becca tossed the chunk and wiped her hands, poetic analogies shoved aside. As she expected, Rudy kept his silence, his eyes dead ahead. His only reaction was the tightening of his jaw, a sign she'd gotten a rise out of him. It's just you and me here, talking about Isabel. Becca lowered her voice, made it personal. Ever since I've taken on this case, Isabel has haunted my thoughts. I can't imagine what you must be going through. She told Rudy the truth, hoping it would draw him out, make him confide in her. But it all stemmed from raw emotion. After a long moment, Rudy looked into her eyes, a sad, damaged expression on his face. A wounded kid with too much on his shoulders. Maybe you do know. Rudy squinted into the sun at her back. Victor told me about your sister. When the conversation turned toward her, Becca stopped, unsure how to proceed. Eventually, she decided to take a risk. Yeah, I bottle it up inside, but that's not the answer. Sometimes, sometimes I can't even breathe. The guilt chokes me. You understand what I'm saying. I know you do. Guilt, he asked, turning in her direction. What guilt do you have? You name it. Guilt I couldn't stop it from happening. Guilt I never found her killer. Guilt I didn't get a chance to tell her how much I loved her. Sound familiar? She fought the lump wedged in her throat. Becca didn't want to cry. She had to stay focused on the case. So tell me, did you ever confront Isabel about her trip out to the estate off I-10? I mean, you were the man of the house with Victor gone. Did she ever tell you what happened? Rudy's lips quivered, and he shut his eyes tight. When he opened them again, he began, She hated how I pushed her. I only wanted what was best for her, you know? But she didn't see it that way. Isabel wanted to be grown up, make her own decisions. Me questioning her came off like... He stopped. Like a parent? She guessed. No. Like Victor. We never knew our father. But who needed one with Father Bro around? When he left home and went off to Houston for seminary school, Isabel and I thought things would be different. Rudy crossed his legs and fiddled with his lunch sack, one of his knees rocking up and down. Nervous energy with a mind of its own or fidgety guilt, Becca had no idea. Although he sat near her, only a shell of him remained in the present. Isabel started to change, spent more time away from home. I saw her that day getting into a Mercedes. I lost it. We had a fight one of many. So when I asked her about the fancy ride, she shut me out, hard. You said Hunter Cavanaugh had been behind the wheel of the car. You admitted it was dark, remember? Becca pressed, making sure he understood. The truth, Rudy. If you and I are going to find out what happened to Isabel, you have to tell me the truth, not what you think happened. Did you actually see him driving the Mercedes? Rudy's eyes flared in anger, but he held his tongue. His face twisted as he struggled to recall what had really happened. Finally, he answered, No, I never actually saw him behind the wheel. His shoulders slumped, and he dropped his chin to his chest. I only recognize the car, nothing else. Rudy wadded up his lunch sack and threw it in anger. His eyes brimmed with tears. Becca admired him for his honesty, but she had to keep him focused and talking. About the necklace... You said Kavanaugh bought it for her. Was that a guess too, or do you know something for sure? By the time he looked up, a tear drained down his cheek. Rudy searched her eyes for relief, but she had none to give. He had to go through this himself. Becca watched him face his demons and knew what it meant. To cut loose Kavanaugh as the culprit behind Isabel's disappearance meant Rudy had to acknowledge the role he'd played, a gut-wrenching realization. She wore it for a class photo once putting on airs. I tore into her about it, asking all sorts of questions like a damned cop. He stopped and shrugged. No offense. None taken. Now please, go ahead. She told me a friend gave it to her, but I didn't believe her. You don't give away something that expensive, I told her. So she changed her story. Someone loaned it to her. I didn't know what to believe. He wiped his face with a sleeve. After a while, Isabel refused to talk about it said I wouldn't listen anyway. You gotta understand, in my neighborhood, good girls don't get gifts like that. Not unless strings are attached, you know? Becca didn't know how to reply. She understood his logic, but felt his deep regret even more. 
She might have taken the same tack with Danielle. At least the old Becca would have. Once Rudy found out about what really happened to Isabel, his worst fears would be vindicated, but that would mean nothing. He'd be empty. His last words with Isabel came from anger, and no amount of justification would heal the wound. He'd have to live with it. So as far as you know, Kavanaugh had nothing to do with the necklace. Is that right? She had to get him to admit it, own up to it. If Rudy couldn't tie the necklace to Kavanaugh, another part of the puzzle dropped away. She would have nothing substantial on the wealthy entrepreneur. Guess so. I never found out who gave her the necklace. Rudy turned away to wipe his face again, his version of reality crumbling. She never said. This book is continued on disc five. No One Heard Her Scream by Jordan Dane continued. Disc five. Hunter Cavanaugh looked squeaky clean on Isabel's unconfirmed ride in the Mercedes and the necklace, at least according to Rudy. But Becca had to shift to a new tactic, and she wasn't looking forward to it. She had to retrace her steps in the investigation, confirming everything. It had to be done. She'd missed something. I got the billings for the renovation project on the Imperial Theater. How often did Victor work the job? His name didn't show up as many times as yours. Becca worded her question to sound as if she already knew about Victor working the job. Her training officer, Lieutenant Santiago, had taught her the trick. Maybe Rudy would answer without thinking. Victor only worked when he was in town, on breaks from seminary school. Our employer threw him a bone now and then. That's all. So it looked like they paid him under the table. Bet that helped your family. Pretty generous of your employer, I'd say. Yeah, they were good to Victor. And me. Guess they thought my brother would put in a good word for them upstairs. Rudy forced a smile. It didn't last long. But if Victor is so plugged into God, why did this happen to Isabel? Becca grabbed a few stones off the ground and rolled them in her hand, thinking of what to say. Nothing would give him comfort. I can't believe God had anything to do with what happened to my sister Danielle. If I did, the world would be a bleak place, without hope. She swallowed hard, searching her own heart. And I don't want to believe that. I refuse to. You may be tempted to lash out at your big brother in frustration and anger at what happened, but I'm here to tell you, don't make that mistake. Now's the time to hang on to each other. Believe me, I know, it's hard to go it alone. Her eyes welled in tears, but she didn't care. I know this is going to be tough, but can you tell me about the last time you saw Isabel Rudy? Becca saw his pain, felt it inside. Believe me, I understand how hard this is, but you've got an open wound in your heart, just like me. It won't heal if you let it fester. Maybe talking about it will help. As a cop, Becca knew her job and how to manipulate a guilty suspect into confessing. But if Rudy had nothing to do with Isabel's murder, she would use his grief to get what she wanted. Justice came with a price tag, one she'd been willing to pay until now until Rudy Marquez. Using a broken young man to get at the truth challenged her moral barometer. I gotta walk. I can't sit anymore. Rudy stood and headed across the asphalt parking lot toward the property next door, an empty lot filled with mesquite trees and underbrush. He never looked back to see if she followed. Maybe he prayed she wouldn't. But as Becca jogged to catch up, a thought crossed her mind. Rudy was a potential suspect, one she trailed alone toward a vacant lot. Out of habit, she reached for the weapon in the holster at the small of her back. Her eyes glanced back to the men near the truck. None of them looked up. Would they even remember she'd been there at all? Becca turned back around and stared at Rudy's back. How lucky did she feel? Her nine millimeter Glock balanced the scales. Rudy, stop right there, she called out. I'm not in the mood for a hike. He slowed his steps and started to wander without direction. Even in his own little world, Rudy looked crushed and beaten. Before he made it to the scrubs, he turned back to face her. Isabel came to the theater to pick me up from work. My car was in the shop. That girl, Sonia Garza, was with her. Rudy paced and chewed at a thumbnail. He quit and jammed his hands into his pockets, but that didn't last long either. She was all dressed up in a blue glittery dress, like a woman, you know, 
She looked so pretty, but older. Did she have a date? A date, he laughed, a hollow sound. Rudy rolled his eyes, no doubt avoiding what he really thought. I have no idea, but Sonia was dressed up too, some tight black dress. She looked cheap. Isabel told me they had some place to be. She tried to rush me, but I wasn't done yet. I mean, my God, my job was feeding the family, you know? She never appreciated that. So let me guess, you argued with her. He nodded and chewed at the corner of his mouth. Bad. We cleared out the place. Guess we got pretty loud. I have to ask, Rudy. Did you hurt Isabel? She kept her eyes on him, waiting for his reaction. He stopped dead, his eyes wide and glistening. He raised his voice. No, I swear to God, I wouldn't hurt her. You have to believe me. At least not the kind that would leave bruises. What does that mean? Becca asked. He shrugged with exasperation, hoping he wouldn't have to explain himself, but no such luck. I called her all sorts of names. I'm not proud of it, okay? I had seven years to kick myself in the butt over this. Think how good I'll be years from now. Rudy raked both hands through his hair, his jaw tense. He kicked a rock with his boot. I left her there. She had plans and I was only in her way. But I never looked back. I walked home by myself. What an ass. Rudy balled his hands into fists and cried aloud. His sobs choked his words. Something happened to her that day because of me being a jerk, and I can't forget it. It replays in my head over and over. Isabel never came home. She never... Before Becca mulled the implications over in her mind, he turned on her and pointed a finger. I gotta ask you something now, and you have to answer, okay? Without waiting for her, he pressed. You ran those tests on Victor and me for our DNA. It wasn't just to get it on file, was it? You found her, didn't you? You found Isabel. Tears streaked his face. A different kind of anger took hold, more aggressive. Becca dialed back her voice to make it non-threatening. Anything might put him over the edge now. I haven't gotten the official report yet. I needed your DNA to compare. Compare to what? His voice cracked. He clenched his fist to punctuate his need. But Becca had no doubt Rudy already knew. Where did you find her? He asked. Please, I gotta know. Tell me where you found Isabel and how she died. I will soon, I promise. His question surprised her. If Rudy killed Isabel, he would have known where to find her body and how she died. The crazed desperation on his face and the twist in her own gut made her a believer. Either Rudy Marquez deserved an Oscar for his performance, or Becca had to look elsewhere to find Isabel's killer. His confusion raised another point. If Rudy had no idea where the police found Isabel's body... She had a good idea Victor had been the Marquez brother outside the theater the morning after it burned. How did Father Victor know Isabel's body would be found inside the Imperial? A sense of urgency swept through her. Becca had to find Father Victor. And she had a feeling Rudy's cooperation wouldn't run in the family. Please join me, Diego. Hunter Cavanaugh waved a hand as he sat behind his desk in the study. I haven't seen you in a while. Days, in fact. I've been busy. Mr. Rivera has asked for my assistance on a private matter. Diego walked into the room and didn't notice Matt Brogan until he got to Kavanaugh's desk. The man stood by a far window, hands clasped behind his back, his usual sneer cast over a shoulder. Typical Brogan, a beefy pit bull with an attitude, camouflaged by expensive threads. A private matter sounds important. Kavanaugh smiled and gestured for Diego to sit. Anything I can do to facilitate my partner's business opportunities, I would be pleased to help in any way I can. No, but thank you for the offer. I will pass your regards on to Mr. Rivera. After unbuttoning his suit jacket, Diego sat and forced a cordial smile. The strained civility between them took effort, and the mounting silence added to the tension. You look like a man with more to say. What's on your mind, Mr. Kavanaugh? Ah, you never disappoint me, Diego. Direct and to the point. I like that. Kavanaugh raised his chin and an eyebrow, his hands clasped over his waist. 
Tell me about the detective the other day. The word detective stopped Diego's heart. The last thing he wanted was for Kavanaugh to take an interest in Rebecca. What do you mean? Well, what did you make of her? I didn't have an opinion either way. Diego threw it back at the man to distract him. Have you heard anything more from her on the arson case? Actually, if my memory serves me, it was a murder investigation. Or did you forget that one minor point? Yes, I suppose you're right. Diego shrugged and pursed his lips. Why is my opinion of the detective important to you? If she hasn't returned to question you further, maybe her investigation has taken a different path. You may have nothing to worry about. My dear boy, I have nothing to worry about regardless. Kavanaugh smiled and leaned back into his leather chair. Perhaps you're right. The detective is of no consequence. Not anymore. Diego narrowed his eyes, Kavanaugh's words registering, but the inference unclear. Any reaction on his part might send the wrong message. Is that all, Mr. Kavanaugh? Diego stood to leave, buttoning his suit jacket. Brogan moved closer, standing behind the chair of his handler. You might find this hard to believe, Diego. You and I have had our differences the last couple of years. But over the course of our working together, I have grown to admire your loyalty. Your discretion is impeccable. The way you look out for the best interests of your employer is admirable. Enviable, in fact. You've earned my respect. Brogan's eyes shifted toward Kavanaugh. His face flinched. The man had no clue what the boss man would say. Diego fought to hide his amusement. In the game of poker, having an unreadable face had merit. An involuntary twitch or a blink would be considered a tell, giving a player away. Brogan was Kavanaugh's tell. Diego wondered if the boss man knew it. You thought I had a death wish, one you might grant, as I recall. Doesn't sound like a mutual admiration society to me. Diego replied, There, you see, Mr. Brogan, he speaks his mind freely, another admirable quality. Kavanaugh laughed aloud, gesturing with enthusiasm. No, you are far too entertaining, Diego. Killing you would be an absolute waste of a bullet. And I don't say that about many people. I see your point, Diego replied, knowing the entire conversation had been lost on Brogan. The man still looked confused, but Kavanaugh grinned, confidence personified. I have a proposition for you, Diego. I'll share it over dinner tonight if you are available. Believe me, it will be worth your time. I'll send a limo for you by eight. Meet the driver out front, curb service. Actually, I'd prefer to meet you. Where are we going? The destination is part of the surprise, I'm afraid. His expression remained steely and unreadable. Compromise is not an option. We won't be riding together. Sorry to say no. I have business to attend to elsewhere, prior to our little engagement. Kavanaugh leaned forward in his chair, his pale blue eyes casting a chill. Join me. Find out what the mystery is all about. Diego stared at the man, searching his face for something he would never find, the truth. Yet for the sake of the missing girls, he really had no choice. I'd love to. Count me in. Finally, Brogan smiled. Chapter 12 Downtown San Antonio, 3.45 p.m. Diego pulled into the parking lot of the Wells Fargo Bank on North St. Mary's Street. Without hesitation, he got out and went into the lobby. Not speaking to anyone, he picked up a brochure and sat in a grouping of chairs designated for loans and new accounts. Sitting behind him, off to the right, a man busied himself with a similar activity. Diego watched the comings and goings of the people in the bank, looking for anything out of the ordinary. The lobby would close soon. Can I help you with anything, sir? A petite older woman in a gray business suit and a string bolo tie smiled at him, her head cocked to one side, sprayed in place. Her big Texas hair looked more like a silver helmet, and her slick colored lips matched her fingernails. No, thank you. I'm waiting for someone. Diego looked down at his bank brochure to avoid a second look at the hair. With her thick Texas accent, the woman kept talking. I see you've got one of our brochures. 
She raised both eyebrows and waited, the same smile frozen on her face. What? He shrugged. You going to charge me for reading it? The minute he said it, Diego regretted his impatience. He only wanted to get on with business and get out of there. Fortunately, the woman took the high road and ignored his shoddy manners. No, silly. She giggled with a hand across her lips. I just wanted to see if I can explain anything to you. You might have a question. If it's in English or Spanish with plenty of pictures, I think I'm good. Diego returned her smile. Thanks anyway. Well, call if you need anything. We're fixing to close up shop, but I'll be right over yonder. She pointed and walked away, her sensible pumps echoing across the lobby floor. After a long moment, the man near him spoke without turning his way. Nice. I think she likes you, Galvin. I never knew you were such a hit with the blue hairs, Mike Draper said with rare amusement in his voice. Those Latin good looks are a real magnet. Is that why you won't leave me alone? Diego fought back a smile, catching Draper's reaction from the corner of his eye. The man almost choked and mumbled under his breath. Male bonding is overrated. With a double dose of testosterone added to his already gritty voice, he got down to business. Talk to me, Galvin. What's going on? Diego indulged in a grin and slouched deeper into his chair, raising the brochure for cover. I had an interesting conversation with our man a couple of hours ago. He wants to have dinner tonight, a real covert affair. He's got a limo picking me up at the estate by eight. No destination, no details. The man likes surprises. Well, I don't. What the hell is this all about? The FBI man questioned. He says he's got a proposition for me, something worth my time. Apparently, I've earned his respect in the loyalty department. Diego cocked his head to the right, his voice low. If it makes you feel any better, he said killing me would be a waste of a bullet. High praise coming from him. So he uses a knife, dead is dead, Draper argued. I don't like it. We gotta talk about this. Nothing to talk about. If we want to find those missing girls, I'm going to have to take the risk, he insisted. Whether Draper went along with this or not, it didn't matter. Diego had made up his mind. A long moment of silence went by with nothing coming from the Fed. Diego tightened his jaw and waited. He searched the faces of the few remaining customers in the lobby. No one stood out. No one watched them. A teller shut the main door but stayed to let the stragglers out. You've already convinced yourself, I can tell. And I see your point. But you're not going in without surveillance, maybe some high-tech toys. The fancy cell phone you gave me is good enough. I'm not getting caught with any 007 spy shit on me. Kavanaugh would kill me on the spot. Tomorrow, when I wake up, I don't want to find myself dead. I'd be real disappointed. Don't worry. I'll keep our surveillance discreet, but you're playing by my rules. You're not going it alone, Galvin. Comprendo, mi amigo? Diego winced. Knock off the lousy Spanish, Draper. You've got all the sincerity of an Anglo-politician trying too hard for the Hispanic vote. And believe me, we're not friends. The Fed ignored him. You got anything else? Diego's thoughts turned to Rebecca. He didn't want to tell Draper about Kavanaugh's specific interest in her. If her backside needed protecting, he preferred to handle it himself, literally, He'd struggled over what was best, but in the end, he couldn't rule out the FBI when it came to her safety. I got a favor to ask. Diego made eye contact. A favor? You owe me a draper. Don't give me attitude. I'm FBI. Attitude is what I do. The man shrugged. Okay, don't get your boxers in a bunch. What is it? You remember the local cop I was telling you about a while back? The one looking into the arson and murder at the theater. Yeah? Well, I think Kavanaugh has taken an interest in her. I don't know what it's about, but I think you should put surveillance on her for the time being. Just for a couple of days, something is going down. I can feel it. Is this a hunch of yours, or you got something to back it up? The Fed asked. Yeah, call it a hunch. Draper looked like a suspicious man, but to his credit, he didn't give Diego any more lip. Okay, consider it done. I'll have someone on her by this evening. Anything else? No, nothing. Diego got up to leave. I gotta go. He tossed the bank brochure onto his vacant seat. When he looked at Draper, the man had a stern expression on his gaunt face and something else on his mind. Kavanaugh's dangerous. Nobody knows it more than you. 
Don't turn your back on him tonight. This smells like a stinking trap. Yeah. As Diego walked toward the door, he muttered under his breath, I know. The Riverwalk, 4.50 p.m. The first chance he got, Diego hit a payphone to call Rebecca on her cell. He had memorized the numbers she'd given him, and using a payphone to make contact served his purpose. He didn't want his call to a cop to show up on his billing records. Rebecca told him to come to her place. She was already home. When he arrived, she greeted him at the door with a fierce kiss. A man could get used to this kind of welcome. He held her in his arms and nuzzled her neck. She smelled so damned good. That's me, the welcome wagon. She groaned when he got to her ear. Mmm, oh, yeah. Diego didn't want to stop, but he worried for Rebecca's safety. With his appointment tonight, he'd be distracted, unable to protect her if she needed it. But he wouldn't tell her about his dinner engagement with Kavanaugh. She had enough on her mind. He pulled away from her arms with reluctance. Earlier today, Kavanaugh said something to concern me, about you. We have to talk. Her eyes narrowed, a questioning look on her face. I shouldn't be a blip on his radar screen. Why would he bring up my name? Rebecca took his hand and led him into the living room. She curled up on the sofa with him by her side. I've got nothing on him with this case I'm investigating. Just my gut. Besides, they've taken me off it officially. What did he say exactly? Diego didn't have much on the man either. With Kavanaugh, it was never what he said, but how he said it, and all the nuances in between. Diego embellished points based on his experiences with Kavanaugh, but mainly, he warned her to be careful, stressed it. The man doesn't make meaningless chatter, Rebecca. If he brought up your name, it's for a reason. Don't underestimate him. I'll be careful. Worry lined her face, but her expression softened when she shifted topics. She raised her chin and nibbled on the corner of her lip, an enticing gesture. Besides, I've got someone new watching my back. I'm not worried. Not me, not tonight, he thought. He hoped Draper could handle her surveillance for tonight. Diego forced a smile, shoving doubt from his mind. Besides, Rebecca was smart and could take care of herself. And tonight, he'd have Kavanaugh with him where he could keep an eye out. Diego would be the first to know if Rebecca courted trouble. But in the meantime, just do me a favor. Let's keep your shades drawn, and I want you to take extra precautions, okay? While she watched, he closed her blinds and drapes and flipped on a light before rejoining her on the couch. Will I see you later? She asked. His mind conjured up images of her. He didn't trust himself to remain a gentleman indefinitely. Even now, he stared at her lips, soft and full, and without restraint, his gaze trailed to her breasts. Do you want me, too? Diego swallowed, hard. His heart beat against his ribs like a hammer. He might be late. How late? She whispered and inched closer. So close, Diego felt the heat off her skin. Throaty and sensual, Rebecca's voice triggered a deep-rooted yearning in him, something he hadn't felt in a very long time, when he looked up, he found her eyes probing his body without the pretense of innocence. He had no doubt she wanted him. Rebecca didn't wait for his answer. She tugged at his tie and loosened it, her eyes never leaving his. In a slow and deliberate gesture, hand over hand, she pulled it from his neck an inch at a time. She flung it over her shoulder, not caring where it landed. I've always been a here and now kind of girl. Rebecca undid the top button to his shirt. One at a time, button by button, she worked her fingers. He felt cool air on his skin as she opened his shirt. Her slender hand raked fingers through his chest hair. Following her lead, Diego mirrored her restraint for the moment. Oh, yeah, he asked. How does that work, the here and now thing? Diego maintained his cool, even with his body raging hot. His lungs gulped air and fueled the flame. Slowly, he trailed a fingertip down her throat. Touching her velvet skin sent a jolt of electricity up his arm and down through his belly. The arousing sensation jabbed at his insides like a roller coaster, spiraling downhill after teetering at its crest. Still, he held back, determined not to be the first to break. When he got to her collar, he took a detour and used the tip of a fingernail to circle a nipple through her blouse. The nub constricted and hardened, making her gasp. Oh, God, 
Rebecca stifled her reaction, not very convincingly. Diego smiled and saw her struggle to regain control as an obstacle to overcome. Up until now, she had harnessed her body's natural impulses, waiting for him to make the first real move to a point of no return, a sensual game. But as her chest heaved, Rebecca moved her breasts against his hand, unable to hold back anymore. She grabbed both his hands and pressed them to her. Here and now, whatever I've got here, you can have right now. That's how it works. Rebecca guided his hands and watched as he took pleasure, no holds barred. I don't think I can wait, she gasped, for later. With her foot, she shoved her coffee table aside and pulled him off the sofa, bringing him to his knees on the carpet. Urgency replaced her subtle, flirtatious game of shedding clothes a piece at a time. Now, without ceremony, Rebecca tugged at his jacket and unbuckled his pants, a race she didn't have to convince him to play. He did the same for her. So many buttons, hooks, and lace. His larger hands almost failed the test. In a sobering moment, when he triggered the on switch to his brain, Diego remembered, I didn't bring anything. He panted, his eyes rolling back in his head. The woman knew how to use her tongue. I mean, I don't have... Oh, God. He shivered, the real good kind. A condom? She finished his thought without stopping. When his concern registered, Rebecca popped her head up with eyes blinking, getting her bearings. Oh, right. She raced to a back room as if she were being timed. Rebecca left him sprawled naked on her living room floor amidst the pile of clothes. With effort, he rose onto his elbows, listening to her rummage through cabinets and drawers, the noise peppered by her muffled curses. He shook his head, unable to hide a grin. When Rebecca returned, Diego couldn't take his eyes off her. All he wanted to do was pick up where they left off, his body making a rally. Naked and glorious, the woman jiggled in all the right spots, and her radiant face showed no sign of being in the least self-conscious, maybe because she was completely engrossed in the fine print of the condom packet. Do these have an expiration date? Rebecca milked the moment. When she looked up and winked, the gesture tugged at his heart. Just kidding. I didn't want you to think I do this all the time. She grinned. Diego laughed out loud, a real belly laugh. It felt so good to let go. He hadn't laughed like this for a very long time. In a rush, Rebecca knelt by his side again. She held his face in her hands and kissed his lips, her tongue fondling his. The sudden affection stole his breath. He took her in his arms and rolled on top, unable to hold back. Diego always thought of himself as an experienced lover. Yet with Rebecca, it felt like the first time... The thrill of it churned his blood. Fierce desire took hold, a desire to please her, to make her need him as much as he needed her, unbridled intimacy. The curves of her soft flesh pressed against his muscled skin. Oh, Diego, yes. She moaned his name, a honeyed sound he never wanted to forget. It echoed through his mind with all the reverence of a prayer whispered in church. None of the lovers who had come before mattered, only Rebecca mattered. She infused him with life, her life. Every fiber of his being took what she offered. She breathed life back into his soul, a drowning man given a second chance. She opened his ears to a life to which he'd been deaf. For so long, he'd been living without hope of a future. He believed it didn't matter. But it did, and Rebecca made him care. She made him want something more. And above all, she made him feel worthy of it. His tongue explored her body, his hands eager to follow. As he caressed her breast, the nipple hardened in his hand. She wrapped her legs around him and clutched at his back, pulling him to her. I want you. She nuzzled his ear. After Rebecca helped him with the condom, her velvet fingers stroking him, he wedged himself between her legs. When she offered her body, he pushed into her dewy cleft, nudging for every quarter inch. As he did, she cried out, Oh my, oh my God. She panted. Am I hurting you? He held still, looking down at her. We don't have to. She held a finger to his lips, her eyes wide. If you stop now, I'll kill you. I've got a gun. Rebecca kissed him hard, running her fingers through his hair. As her eyes glistened with the start of tears, she whispered, It feels so incredible. Please don't stop. I've never wanted anything more in my entire life, Diego. To make her point, Rebecca moved her hips, grinding into him. 
Oh, yeah, he groaned. You've convinced me. Slow and easy, Diego writhed to the rhythm of her body, letting her guide his every move. At her urging, he picked up the pace, sweat glistening off the skin of his tanned forearms. Her fevered groans drove him dangerously close to orgasm, but he resisted the driving urge. His hands grasped Rebecca's as he struggled to hold on, his release second to hers. He surged harder, faster. Finally, Rebecca thrust her hips into him and convulsed deep inside. Yes, oh, yes. Her body clenched at him, a suckling embrace. He had nothing left to resist. Diego arched his back, veins jutting from his neck. Ah, ah, God, he cried as he spilled into her, wave after wave. Sweet Rebecca. They climaxed as one, depleted and shuddering. An overwhelming rush of emotion filled his heart as he gave himself to her, body and soul. No more holding back. Absolute and profound joy. And when he stared down at her face, made more beautiful by their love, if that was even possible, he smiled to see that tears streaked her cheeks. He pictured a velvet white rose under a pastel dawn, its petals covered in dew, and marveled at the sheen of her blushing skin. Perfect. Simple. Complete. Thoroughly spent, Diego buried his face in the warmth of her neck, his lips addicted to her. He rolled over and drew her into his arms, letting the stillness of the room settle upon them. Speaking aloud would only break the spell. But as he listened to her heart and felt her breaths against his chest, he finally let it all go. His own tears trickled down his face, and he was not ashamed. Diego believed in second chances, and in Rebecca's arms he had found his. In the wake of Diego's leaving her place, an oppressive stillness lingered, a void where he had once been. He shared his life and his intimacy with her, and now, without him, the stillness had moved to her heart, nestled beside a euphoria she had never known. Diego. She whispered his name to hear how it sounded on her lips. Becca wiped away the steam from her bathroom mirror, unable to do the same with the smile on her face. She pulled a thick white robe around her and brushed her wet hair while images of him ran rampant in her mind. She basked in the afterglow of Diego Galvin making love to her. Breathing in the last of the steam from her shower, she shut her eyes and replayed it all again, his lips on her body, his hands caressing her breasts, and the feel of him deep inside her. A gentle touch turned to a driving force, culminating with an all-consuming release, and all she wanted was to do it again. Now, with eyes tight, she indulged herself. Becca reached under her robe and ran fingers over her breasts, imagining the feel of his hands. Heat rose from her body and rushed to her face. Her heart throbbed at her eardrums from inside, and each breath awakened memories of him, stirring and unforgettable. Oh, God, this is insane, she gasped. Becca stopped and opened her eyes. I can't. Nothing would equal his raw yet undeniable capacity to caress her body. Her new lover, rare and extraordinary. And what about her tears? She remembered being overwhelmed by the force of her orgasm. But the flood of emotion surrounding it surprised her. In hindsight, she dwelled on that single moment. Why had it affected her so profoundly? Becca knew the rush of feelings had little to do with the amazing sex, although most women would disagree, vehemently. No, for the first time, she had made love to a man with her heart wrapped up in the gift. And shocker of shockers, she let him love her back the same way. No man made love like that without having more at stake than the fleeting gratification of toe-curling, nipple-raising, brain-expanding sex. And for once, the high stakes didn't scare her. He had promised to meet her late tonight. A thought brought another smile to her face. This time, it'll be about you, Diego but I've got a ton of things to do first. In the waning hours of the afternoon, Becca got ready for her late-night caller with plenty of errands. Now her kitchen was stocked with groceries for the meal she planned, a mix of aphrodisiacs and finger foods to draw attention to her mouth. And she splurged on a playful array of enticements, some old tried and trues, many new and different even to her. Things to try together. Becca had no idea what he would like or even if he had food allergies. She laughed at how frivolous her preparations made her feel, like a teenage girl with a heart-stopping crush. 
Oh, Beck, you've got it bad, she chastised herself. Becca had stocked her bathroom with scented oils and placed more candles around the tub and in the bedroom. It would take forever to light them all. And with a big grin plastered on her face, she concealed condom packets in decorative tins, arranging them throughout her condo within an arm's reach of an inspired moment. She even practiced maneuvering for them, picturing the surprised look on his face when she'd whip one out. Becca hadn't heard his laughter until today, but a girl could get addicted to the sound of it. Saving the task for last, Becca remade her bed and tossed red rose petals over the comforter. The fragrance filled the room. With the stage set, she brushed a hand across the fresh white linens. She pictured Diego's muscular body under them with a wicked yet playful smile on his handsome face. This I gotta see in the flesh. Becca glanced at her watch. How late is late, she wondered. Now it would be a waiting game, and patience was not her gig. But her cell phone rang to bail her out. Hello? Her voice coy. Becca thought it might be Diego asking to come over. Detective Montgomery, this is Sonia Garza. Her timid voice was hard to hear over the traffic noise in the background. You, you said I should call. You gave me your card. Yes, Sonia, I'm here. What's going on? Becca narrowed her eyes. Diego had been a brief oasis, an amazing and consuming distraction. He'd been a glimmer of light piercing the shroud of Danielle's abduction and murder. But at the sound of Sonia's voice, the weight of her life and the Marquez murder case came back in a rush like a harsh slap to her face. The cold reality of it sent a chill scurrying across her skin. Right before Diego called, Becca had spent the afternoon in search of Father Victor Marquez. A visit to the family home only met with Isabel's mother unable to help. The woman didn't speak enough English to answer Becca's questions on the whereabouts of the priest. And Rudy's red truck wasn't parked out front. Neither of the brothers was home. Retracing her steps in the investigation had given legs to her case. And Sonia had been next on her list of follow-ups. She'd been a witness to the argument Rudy had with Isabel around the time the girl went missing. Becca needed her take on the fight and the details of the timeline she was building of Isabel's last hours. But the sound of Sonia's voice on the line stirred a twist in her gut. What now? I want... I have to, to tell you something? Sonia sobbed, her words garbled. Slow down, Sonia, I can barely hear you. Becca sat on the edge of her mattress, the phone pressed to her ear. She plugged a finger in the other one. What do you need to tell me? Not on the phone, please. You won't understand, she cried. Can you meet me? Sonia had reached out and contacted her. Normally a good sign, but something tugged at Becca's instincts. Despite her misgivings, she had no choice but to hear the girl out. Yeah, just tell me where and when. Becca listened to the girl's instructions, and again, she glanced at her watch, one thought on her mind. Late better be late, my love. Duty calls. Cavanaugh Estate, 8 p.m. Dressed in an Armani suit, Diego looked at himself in a hallway mirror to straighten his tie. He knew his outward appearance was the same, but inside he had changed. He fought hard to hide the smile emerging from deep in his soul. Rebecca's influence, a sensation he hoped would be permanent. But a dark and sinister rumbling tainted his happiness, replaced by the face of Hunter Cavanaugh. He took a deep breath, remembering he had a limousine to catch. Diego turned from the mirror and made his way to the grand staircase. Tonight, it could all be over, one way or the other. At the top of the stairs, Diego touched the butt of his forty-five caliber Colt, the weapon in its holster at the small of his back, and he felt for the sheath of knives strapped to his leg. Reassuring old habits, Diego buttoned his suit jacket and walked down toward the foyer, lost in thought. Kavanaugh might not have an ulterior motive. Maybe the man had been straight up and would tell him everything he'd need to nail his despicable arrogant ass. A man like him didn't deserve fair play. If it went down like that, Draper would lose the permanent grimace etched on his face. The overbearing FBI man might see fit to let his father, Joe Rivera, step out from under the threat of an indictment held over his head. And Diego would reclaim his life, a life with a glimmer of hope, thanks to Rebecca. Better still, if the missing girls were alive, Kavanaugh might reveal their location. They could be rescued from a living hell. Since Rebecca had told him about her sister, Diego put faces to each girl, 
even Danielle's. He had forced Draper to give them their case files and photos. He'd studied them, committed each to memory. In his mind, he pictured what they were like before the long arm of a sexual predator stole their lives for money, capitalizing on the depraved weaknesses of others. Big business built on a foundation that human life had no worth. For him, these girls weren't blank canvases anymore. Each had a name, a face, and people who loved them. Even now, candles burned in vigil until they came home. Diego knew the rest of their lives would be an uphill struggle to heal, but at least they would have their lives back. And in the arms of their families, they wouldn't be alone. He understood the value of hope. It might work out that way. He preferred not to think of the alternative, but he had no choice, being a realistic guy. Draper said it first. Kavanaugh may be setting up an elaborate trap, complete with a last meal. How very civil. It is what it is, he muttered under his breath as he walked across the tiled atrium. The stakes were too high not to take the risk. Diego shut the front door behind him and stood under the elaborate red awning over the entryway outside. As promised, a black stretch limo was parked at the curb, ready to pick him up for his solo ride to Kavanaugh's mystery location. Dressed in the formal uniform of a chauffeur, the driver hustled around the vehicle to open his door, all part of the service. Diego took a deep breath and got inside. The soundproof vacuum of the interior had the feel of a cocoon when the door slammed shut, giving an eerie quality to the voice that greeted him. Glad you decided on coming to our little shindig. It wouldn't have been the same without you. Matt Brogan grinned, you being the guest of honor and all. Diego held firm to his composure. Only the hair raised on the nape of his neck gave him away. Chapter 13 Northwest San Antonio, 8.15 p.m. Becca had gotten lucky, no doubt about it, and she wasn't one to downplay her stroke of good fortune. She glared into a rearview mirror to make certain the burgundy sedan still tailed her from downtown. A Lexus LS430. A burned-out headlight made her notice and now helped her spot the vehicle in traffic, several cars back. Becca clenched the steering wheel of her unmarked Crown Vic, her mind racing with scenarios on how to play this. But first, she had to confirm the unwanted surveillance. Under the ebb and flow of street lamps, she tried for a glimpse of the driver by changing speed. But the windows on the Lexus were too heavily tinted, a curse for police officers making traffic stops. And forget about a peek at the tags. Nope, no such luck from this distance. Heading west on Loop 410, she hit the Ingram Park Mall area and made her exit. As she eased to a stop, she kept her eyes on the mirror. Headlights from a car behind the sedan only showed the driver in dark silhouette. A man, by her guess. At the frontage road light, she pulled a U-turn under the overpass. The Lexus followed. Sonia asked to meet near the dumpsters in the south parking lot of the Regal Movie Theater, Cielo Vista 18 on Cinema Ridge. The massive complex was located across the freeway from the mall. Becca would keep her promise to meet the young woman, but not before she figured out if paranoia was messing with her head. If the guy tailing her had his heart set on a blockbuster movie, why drive to the Burbs to satisfy his stale popcorn and goobers addiction? Becca would know soon enough. If the jerk had other things on his mind, she wouldn't lead the bastard straight to Sonia. Hell, if things played out her way, she might get the chance to ask him herself, up close and personal. With fewer cars on the residential side streets, her pursuer would have to lag farther behind and risk losing her, a major disadvantage. But Becca had a problem, too. She'd be easier to track. Timing would be everything. She'd have to pick her spot and pray her luck held. Becca saw the cinema up ahead on top of a ridge, a sprawling facility. Moviegoers pulled in and out of the lot, a hive of activity. One of the reasons Sonia had picked it. Some big movie must have let out. She glanced at the clock on her dash. Fifteen minutes before the meet time, Becca knew she'd be late. Avoiding the theater down the street, she made an immediate right and accelerated up Ingram into an older section of town. Callahan Road was the next major intersection. Fewer houses lined the streets, making the road darker. Bigger lots with acreage for sale, but not many lights. Better odds for her, she figured. Plus, Becca's car was the only one on the road. She slowed down, waiting to see if her tail drove straight for the theater or followed her down the side street. 
Becca smiled when the Lexus turned and shut off his one good headlight. A careless move. He had made things way too easy. Now she had no doubt the surveillance was meant for her. Becca felt the pressure of her Glock in its holster under her jacket. Time to play. The street elevations in this section of town would serve her purpose. She gunned it over a ridge and searched for the right timing to turn off her headlights. Two could play that game. After cresting a hill, she killed her lights and sped for a dark side street to the right. Her tires squealed as she made the abrupt turn. Becca turned her Crown Vic around at a cross street and kept her motor running. She waited in the dark, looking like a parked car at the curb. Adrenaline jacked her up, forcing her heart to beat full throttle. The sound of her breathing filled the vacuum of the car. No sign of the Lexus. She licked her lips and leaned forward, chest heaving. Where are you, buddy? She whispered, her voice dry and raspy. Come on, don't let me down. Finally, the sedan drove past the street. Becca hit the gas pedal and gunned it to the corner. When she hit the main drag, she turned right and spotted the Lexus up ahead. She accelerated to close the gap, to read a tag or catch a look at the driver. But as soon as the car got near Callahan Road, the guy must have spotted her. He spun out, heading east at high speed, no lights. Damn it. She only got a partial read on the tag. The rest, she couldn't be sure. Becca had a decision to make in the blink of an eye. Pursue the bastard or let him go. A high-speed chase in this area of San Antonio had a lower risk than one in a more densely populated residential neighborhood. But if she did this thing, she had no choice but to run Code 3 to act as a warning beacon. The way the Lexus tore through city streets without headlights put innocent bystanders at risk. Not backing down, Becca floored the Crown Vic in pursuit and hit the switch panel on her dash. At the punch of a button, her headlights flashed and her siren wailed. The spiraling lights cast eerie shadows onto the mesquite trees, scrub oaks, and barbed wire fence posts whizzing by. Suddenly, the Lexus swerved hard left onto a side street, trying to lose her. Shit. She gripped the wheel, leaning into the turn. His car spun out, kicking up gravel in a spray. Rocks pummeled her windshield. Each loud smack sounded like a bullet. In reflex, she shielded her face with a hand. Becca's heart leapt into her throat. Her breaths came in short gasps. Now you're just pissing me off. She gritted her teeth and maneuvered through narrow streets and low water areas, trying to make up ground. She zipped past low-rent horse stables to her right. Her flashers reflected off the eyes of a curious bay quarter horse. The animal bolted and trotted off for a quieter piece of ground. Sorry, big fella. Suddenly, her crown vic hit a pothole, and the jolt jarred her teeth. One of her hands popped loose from the wheel. Her seatbelt locked and drew tight across her chest, the edge cutting into her neck. Becca tugged to make it release. No luck. That's when the guy hit a series of S-curves and a fork in the road. He never slowed down. His tires screeched at every turn. With only her headlights to guide her, she peered through the shadows up ahead for a way to end this. What the hell are you doing? She had no idea if her question had been directed at the maniac up ahead or herself, the crazed woman behind the wheel of the Crown Vic. Normally, Becca would call for backup on her radio. But explaining her reason for the high-speed chase would get her butt in a sling, no matter how justified. Santiago might cover for her, but Draper was another matter. He'd have her ass canned and throw away the opener. The way she saw it, she had only a short window of opportunity. She had to catch the Lexus, fast. But her luck had run out. The madman had been heading for the lights of the freeway. Now one of the side streets cut onto the frontage road of Loop 410. With more traffic, too much could go wrong. Unable to make her chase official, she had no choice but to back off and kill her pursuit. That's it. I'm gone. She couldn't risk it. Not anymore. People might get hurt. But the bastard took advantage of his lead and ran a light. He cut across lanes of traffic to hit the freeway entrance ramp. Becca grimaced as other drivers veered to miss him. Tires skidded to a halt. She let the asshole go, never getting close enough to pull more than a partial tag. After turning into the left lane, she cut her speed and watched the red taillights of the Lexus merge into traffic up the hill. With his headlights back on, he headed east, back the way he came. Damn it to hell! She pounded the steering wheel with a fist and groaned in frustration at being so close. Ugh. Becca took a deep breath to slow her heart. She checked out the time on her dash and made a turn back to the movie theater. A quarter to nine. She had no idea if Sonia would wait long, but she'd find out soon enough. Who had tailed her in the Lexus and why? The pricey car ruled out almost her entire list of suspects. 
all except one. Cool water, a placid surface as unchanging as glass. Diego pictured the image and tried to maintain his composure as he watched Brogan in silence. His muscles tense like a tight spring. He sat ready to defend himself if it came to that. His dangerous companion stared back with dead eyes, like a coiled rattler in tall grass. Brogan looked content with the absence of conversation as traffic and road noise droned in the background. The limo headed downtown. Diego kept a vigilant eye on the route they took. He had no way of knowing whether Draper followed, but he was sure the FBI man had his back. The guy had the tenacity of a pit bull and the face to match. But Diego hated not knowing what lay ahead. With their destination being downtown, Rebecca's home turf, he had a growing suspicion she played a part in Kavanaugh's game of intimidation. After Diego's last glance out the window, Brogan smirked as if he read his mind. You don't look like a guy who likes surprises, Mex, Brogan smirked. Neither do you. His steely gaze and quick, understated comeback made the man flinch. Brogan's sneer faded. The limousine maneuvered through the historic arts village of La Villita and pulled up to the curb outside a trendy new restaurant called Fusion on the river. Diego had read about it. Its new and innovative menu combined the melting pot of cultures located in the region. An extravagant fare of continental cuisine blended with the old world charm and grace of San Antonio. The limo driver let them out, and Diego followed Brogan inside. Hunter Cavanaugh had reserved a private dining room in the rear. Gentlemen, glad you could join me. Cavanaugh welcomed them with open arms and a glass of wine. Diego, please take the seat across from me. An intimate scene, polished silver on white linen, flickering candles, and fresh-cut flowers created an elegant table setting. Tasteful oil paintings of local artists decked the stucco walls. The restaurant was a maze of small rooms with terraced outside patios carved into the South Bank hillside of the San Antonio River. They placed their order and dined on an array of appetizers, compliments of the house. The owner of the restaurant was an old acquaintance of Hunter's. You have admirable taste, Mr. Cavanaugh. Diego gave the man his due as he admired the restaurant. Is this a special occasion? Yes, you might say that. With his Nordic good looks and aristocratic features, Hunter Cavanaugh commanded the evening with his usual flair for the dramatic. His eloquent voice resonated in the private room. Sometimes a man must cut his losses and begin afresh, and I am on the verge of being reborn. A spiritual awakening, or are you referring to a business venture? Diego asked. He forced a smile, hiding the knot in his gut. In his most subtle way, Cavanaugh enjoyed twisting the knife. And tonight Diego knew the man would take his time. He would not be rushed. His polar opposite, Brogan sprawled in his chair and gulped wine without the slightest interest in conversation. The ambiance was wasted on him. The bastard would be in his element, with a cold brew and a TV remote in his hand with a barca lounger under his ass. Diego heard the vibrating buzz of the man's cell phone under the table. But Brogan only checked out the phone display, not answering. Glancing at his watch, he looked preoccupied. Ah, oh, a spiritual rebirth or a new business venture, an astute question, Diego. Cavanaugh raised a finger and winked. Over the years of our association with global enterprises, I have been impressed by you. And your loyalty to Mr. Rivera is certainly commendable. In similar fashion, Mr. Brogan would do anything for me. And I assure you, he has. You seem to be making a point. Diego narrowed his eyes and took a sip of wine, and I am content to wait for it. Yes, Cavanaugh grinned. I've noticed. You are a very patient man. In that regard, you and I are very much alike. I, too, value composure, especially under stress. And I'm not afraid to make difficult decisions, even at the expense of others. Perhaps this is where we part company. What do you mean? You talk a good game, and you hold your own in a fight. Kavanaugh glanced at Brogan. The man jerked his head, suddenly paying attention. On more than one occasion, Mr. Brogan reported for work sporting unexplained bruises or a broken nose, presumably after having a conversation with you. But deep down, Diego, you have a soft heart. Don't try to deny it. Why do I get the impression you consider compassion to be a sign of weakness? Because it is, my dear Diego, it is. Cavanaugh smiled, 
his fierce eyes unwavering. Brogan leaned his elbows on the table and glared at Diego as if he played a hand in the coy conversation. But when his cell phone sprang to life again, the smug bastard checked the incoming number and excused himself from the table to take the call. On the surface, Diego was a pristine lake at dawn. But underneath, he churned to know what was happening with Brogan. And worse, Kavanaugh pretended not to notice or even care. Diego had a feeling he wasn't going to enjoy Kavanaugh's brand of after-dinner entertainment. I'm waiting to hear about the proposition you have for me. All in good time, Diego. All in good time. An old mustard-colored Ford Fiesta sat at the back of the cinema parking lot, rust eating at its wheel wells and belching puffs of black smoke. The car was running with someone inside. Becca circled the vehicle, getting a good look at the driver. She pulled up facing in the opposite direction on the driver's side and rolled down her window. Sonia had her arm out, flicking ashes from her smoke. Between the exhaust fumes and the cigarettes, her lungs had to be a ticking time bomb. I almost left, she chewed at the corner of her mouth. Her eyes darted to her rearview mirror, checking out the empty lot behind them. Real antsy. How come you were- She stopped in mid-question and tossed her butt. I got scared, is all. Yeah, I'm sorry. Becca had no intention of telling Sonia what had happened. The woman was spooked enough. But I'm here now. You said you had something to tell me in person. You got my ear. The high-speed chase had left Becca's nerves frayed. On edge, she kept her foot on the brake and her car running, ready to bolt at a moment's notice. And she gripped her Glock. The weapon was out of its holster and in her lap. The meat left her leery, her senses wired. Under any other circumstances, meeting a first-time snitch, Becca would have asked Sonia to keep her hands visible. But the move might kill any chance she had to get the young woman to open up. Becca had to take a risk. The other day, at my apartment, Sonia began, her voice choked with emotion. She didn't look Becca in the eye. I didn't tell you everything, and I may have lied. Nice opener. Sonia had her attention. May have? That's like saying I'm sort of pregnant. What did you lie about? Without trying to alarm Sonia, Becca kept an eye out for a burgundy Lexus. She scanned the cars parked in the lot for any unusual movement. You gotta understand, I was scared. Talking about Isabel after all this time, it brought back the nightmares. I haven't been able to sleep. She clutched her steering wheel and peered through the windshield and into her rearview mirror, agitated. Fuck, I don't think I can do this she muttered, letting her head fall back against her headrest, her shoulders slumped. Oh no, you got me out in the burbs, Sonia. Becca shook her head and tried a little lame humor to put the girl at ease. You gotta understand, I don't do burbs, too many malls and minivans. You can't clam up on me now. Eyes wide, Sonia stared at her before she ventured a faint smile. The gesture didn't last. Becca softened her tone, but her eyes made one more pass at the parking lot. Come on. You want to clear the air or else you wouldn't have called. Talk to me. I lied about the Mercedes. Sonia looked out the corner of her eye, but shut them tight and took a deep breath. I got into that car with Isabel. Tell me what happened, Sonia. And why did you lie about it? You're mad. I can hear it in your voice. Sonia fidgeted in her seat, a hand tight on the wheel, eyes alert. I only want to get at the truth here. Becca softened her tone. Tell me about the trip you took in the Mercedes. Let's focus on that. Sonia lit another smoke. After a few drags, she loosened up. Isabel had arranged everything. We drove out I-10, some rich guy's place. I never paid attention how we got there. Sonia's latest version of the truth corroborated Rudy's story. Becca had never told her Isabel's brother had followed the Mercedes out I-10 to the Kavanaugh estate. Pieces to the puzzle were fitting into place. We never went into the mansion, only stayed in the back. They had a pool house. Everything was lit up, a real fancy party. Lots of hot older guys in expensive clothes, and plenty of girls, too, dressed real nice. I felt out of place. My dress wasn't the best, but it was all I could afford. I felt so grown up in it, even though we were kind of young compared to everyone else, but none of the people made us feel like party crashers, you know? The party sounded real friendly. Yeah, it was. Those rich people made me feel like a rock star. The guys flirted and got me drinks. Isabel said they were always like that, real gentlemen. 
Isabel must have been to a few of their parties if she knew that. Sonia narrowed her eyes, a questioning look on her face. Yeah, I guess so. But I never figured that out until later. What happened next? Becca prompted. I started to feel dizzy and sick to my stomach. I thought I had too much to drink, you know. But one of the guys took care of me. He took me into the pool house, let me lie down on a bed. But something must have happened. You kept this part from me, why? A dark memory shrouded her face. Sonia tensed her jaw and avoided looking at Becca. That's because later I found out I was the big attraction. You see, they had a special room set up just for me. Sonia smiled with a look of confusion on her face, a strange distant gaze. Her cigarette hung between her fingers, burned almost to the stub. Couldn't she feel the heat? The guy started to take my clothes off. I told him no, but he only laughed. Other men were in the room. They did things to me, but I couldn't move. Sonia dropped the butt from her fingers, barely noticing. She looked too numb to move a muscle, mesmerized and haunted by her past. As much as she wanted to console the girl, Becca kept her eyes trained on the parking lot and the empty acreage behind them. She wiped the sweat off her palm, the one holding the Glock. After that, it got real fuzzy. All those rich men at the party, their faces kept coming at me one after another, laughing, pointing. Some of them were naked, sometimes more than one. I can still hear them. She cried. And I have nightmares, even now. Sonia went on, each remembrance worse than the last. A lost soul with rock-bottom self-esteem. No wonder she suffered from nightmares. The shame, the degradation. Becca couldn't imagine a young life being shut down by such cruelty. Each new revelation brought Sonia's tragic world closer. Its oppressive weight made it hard for Becca to breathe. Danielle must have suffered the same way. Only her ordeal ended in a torturous, violent death. Overwhelming grief flooded Becca, sucking the air from her lungs. She couldn't catch her breath. Tears blurred her sight, but Becca fought the urge to cry. She kept her mind focused on the case, on the here and now, on Sonia. Becca cleared her throat and shoved her personal torment aside so she could function. Where was Isabel through all this? Did the same happen to her? She felt fragile, unsure she wanted to hear the answer to her question. So many lives ruined. No wonder Diego risked his life to stop a man like Kavanaugh. I found out later that Isabel left me there. Sonia broke down and cried, her face wincing with each disturbing reminder. Yeah, some best friend, huh? That's why we didn't hang out after that. I never forgave her, and that night ruined the rest of my life. And God, I was so afraid Isabel would tell what happened. Sonia shifted in her seat and faced Becca to stress her point. You know what it feels like to live with fear every day? You think others see what happened in your face, like it's tattooed across your forehead. Whenever anyone looked at me sideways, I thought they knew. I lived in constant fear Isabel would tell on me, so I kept my mouth shut. You never reported it to the police. You could have pressed charges. Becca knew the answer before Sonia opened her mouth. People like me don't talk to cops, lady. Press charges? No fucking way. Sonia picked at the torn upholstery of her door panel. When she began again, her voice was faint. When Isabel went missing, I thought I'd be next. I hid and didn't talk to anyone. But after a while... What, Sonia? Tell me. A new tear slid down her cheek. It was a relief she was gone. It meant my secret went with her. I didn't have to worry no more. In the pale light, Sonia's face glistened with tears and bitterness. I couldn't tell you before. I was too ashamed. That's why I lied. Please don't be mad. A part of Becca had a soft spot for Sonia, but she had lied before. Why would this version be the truth? I have a witness who puts you at the Imperial Theater with Isabel when she had a fight with her brother Rudy. Tell me about it. Sonia narrowed her eyes and shook her head like she didn't remember the incident. I don't know. Then her eyes registered something. God, that was so long ago. Yeah, I remember she went to this old theater to pick up her brother from work. 
They had your typical brother-sister argument, and he split. Not much to tell. We were going to a club, so we went. It was no big deal. What do they argue about? Do you remember? Sonia grimaced and shook her head. Don't remember exactly. Except it had something to do with his job, feeding the family, and her rushing him so we could party. Guess he didn't like working so hard so she could play. And that's all you remember about it? Yeah, that's it. Like I said, it was no big deal. Is there anything else you want to tell me? Like what? The woman asked. Stall tactic. Answering a question with a question. Sonia erected a speed bump in Becca's path toward the truth. What was she hiding now? Like who was driving the Mercedes? Did you get a name? Yeah, I got a name. But I have to tell you about the necklace first. It's all connected. Sonia fixed her eyes on Becca. I know who gave Isabel the necklace, the heart with the diamonds. She got it from an older guy. Becca's heart sputtered to a stop. She held her breath, again expecting the name of Hunter Cavanaugh to come up. Who? You know the name of the guy? Sonia nodded, her face in shadows. A guy by the name of Matt Brogan gave it to her. I don't know where he got it or nothing, but Isabel told me he gave it to her. She was real proud of it, you know. And he's the guy who drove you to the party, the one with the Mercedes. Yeah, he's the one. Matt Brogan. Becca remembered him. She had met the guy at Cavanaugh's and made a note of his name in her casebook. Now her mind flooded with speculations. Becca wouldn't have considered Brogan an older man, but to a teenager seven years ago, he might have come off that way. Plus, the guy had the money to afford the necklace and drive a Mercedes. And with his link to Hunter Cavanaugh, a man under FBI surveillance for human trafficking, the pieces to Becca's mystery were falling into place. Was Cavanaugh back on her list of suspects, or was Brogan operating on his own? From what she remembered, Brogan gave off a nasty vibe, a real cold fish. Could he be operating a prostitution ring under the nose of his rich boss? Or was Cavanaugh giving the orders? No matter which way things turned out, Diego had to be told. This put a whole new slant on his human trafficking angle. All Becca wanted to do was see Diego, to talk to him, to be with him. He had become her oasis in the dismal wasteland of this case. But you gotta promise me, Sonia pleaded. Don't tell Brogan I was the one who told. He'd kill me if he found out. You think Matt Brogan still remembers you? I mean, seven years is a long time ago. Oh, believe me. He remembers how we met, and the bastard knows who I am. How can you be sure? Sonia took her time answering. She lit another cigarette, gathering up the courage for one last push of her story. Becca witnessed the toll it took. The young woman swallowed hard, her breathing coming in short gasps like she was hyperventilating. Sonia ran a hand through her hair and cleared her throat. The party ended, but not for me. Matt Brogan kept me for himself and some of his... Men, the things he made me do, and without the drugs, I remembered everything. She wiped her face with a sleeve, her mascara smeared. He threatened to kill me if I ever told. Sonia looked like she wanted to throw up. Even in the shadows, her face looked ghostly white, and her lips trembled when she lifted the cigarette for another drag. She stopped and spoke in a shaky voice. I learned the hard way. Matt Brogan is a sadist as vicious and cruel as they come, and he may be the one who killed Isabel. Chapter 14 Fusion on the River Restaurant, 10.50 p.m. Once more, Brogan excused himself from dinner with a phone call. This time, he never returned. Diego pretended not to notice his absence, but it weighed heavy on his mind, and he felt certain Kavanaugh recognized his discreet signs of anxiety despite his efforts to hide them. Diego picked at his meal, forcing himself to eat, smile, and carry on a conversation. In sharp contrast, his host looked very much at ease. He challenged Diego's intellect with discussions of local politics and the business climate, both domestic and abroad. And the man even speculated about the long-term impacts of the energy crisis on the travel industry. Normally, Kavanaugh had no patience with idle chit-chat, but tonight he reveled in it, with a shrewd smirk on his face. By the time coffee was served, Diego's neck was knotted with tension. His eyes darted for the door or out the window, his concentration long gone. They were practically the only customers in the place, 
but with Kavanaugh's connections to the owner, the man took advantage of his pull. Could he trust Draper to watch over Rebecca? Remembrances of his afternoon with her haunted him, along with the distinct feeling it may have been for the last time. A premonition or the product of an overactive imagination? He had no idea. Either way, his wariness betrayed him to the man who latched onto another's weakness with a stranglehold. You look distracted, Diego. Kavanaugh's pale blue eyes looked glacial. Anything I can do to help? Smug didn't begin to describe Kavanaugh's face. He beamed with a mix of contempt and self-importance, setting Diego's temper on edge. He had grown tired of playing by the man's rules. Up until now, biding his time had allowed him to operate under Kavanaugh's nose without notice. And over the last couple of years, he had a sense Kavanaugh had grown accustomed to his being around, the closest he might get to trust from the man. But during the last week, something had changed. Kavanaugh scrutinized him with the same interest he had in the beginning, a lab rat before the start of a grand experiment. But once the rat served its purpose, it got tossed out belly up and stiff as a board. Diego glanced down at remnants of their cheese course and understood where the rat analogy came from, but it didn't make him feel any more in control. He ventured a change in direction. If this dinner was a game of football, I'd have to penalize Brogan for delay of game. Diego observed, do you have any idea where he slithered off to? I'm not a fan of sports metaphors, but I do commend your rather late offensive maneuvering. Mr. Brogan has duties to attend to, orders of mine to be precise. Why? Kavanaugh stressed the words orders of mine and dared him to ask his meaning, but a frontal assault would only feed the man's ego. Diego needed a different approach. No reason. I thought he might like a doggy bag. Diego smiled at Kavanaugh's surprised reaction when he didn't rise to the baited question. On paper, the merger with Global Enterprises has been mutually beneficial. Wouldn't you agree? He asked, watching Kavanaugh cock his head in question. Yes, I believe you know how I feel about your generous employer. I would like to think we have a rather lucrative future together. And I certainly enjoy the infusion of cash into my international travel enterprise. Why do you ask? You should know I did the original financial analysis of the merger and brokered the deal to Mr. Rivera. But in the end, I recommended against it. I was overruled and assigned to direct the transition period. Mr. Rivera wanted his resident skeptic to be satisfied. And are you? The man asked. In short, no. I get the sense you don't trust me as the business liaison between our two organizations. You appear to keep certain aspects of your affairs to yourself. Unexplained trips and undisclosed meetings with certain clients. If we are building a relationship for future endeavors, I believe a more solid base of trust should be mandatory. I agree, but I had no idea how strongly you felt on the subject. Interesting. Kavanaugh sipped his coffee and peered over the cup. If you don't have faith in me... I fail to see how this business opportunity with Mr. Rivera can be optimized to the fullest. I intend to discuss the matter with him, in fact. Bravo, Diego. Kavanaugh sat back in his chair, a broad grin on his face. Soulless eyes flickered with a touch of humor. Get a man's attention by trying to snatch his wallet. I suppose dinner should be on you. Is that all you've got to say? Can you be discreet, Diego? The man leaned over the table. Before he replied, Kavanaugh waved his hand and added, Forget I asked that. Of course you can. After all, you are a loyal man. You would never do anything to harm Mr. Rivera or myself. Isn't that right? Diego narrowed his eyes and kept his silence, his jaw tensed. Kavanaugh smiled. Before you bring anything to Mr. Rivera's attention... I have something you must see firsthand, a business opportunity I have savored for a long time. Low overhead, bountiful yet expendable inventory, and exceedingly profitable. I feel certain your employer would have a keen interest in my endeavors, but on a more global scale. I had only waited to present this opportunity when the time was right. I hope you forgive me for my timing. As I've said on many occasions, I value trust and loyalty as much as your Mr. Rivera. I appreciate your candor, Mr. Kavanaugh, and the opportunity for my employer. Diego raised his chin, 
unsure how to proceed. Maybe the man had arranged the dinner for a real purpose. For the sake of the missing girls, he had to play this out. Please forgive me if I jump to the wrong conclusion. I'm interested in seeing your new business venture. Care to share any details in advance? No, I'd prefer to wait. Your honest first impression might help me gauge your employer's reaction. But before we go, I'd like a snifter of cognac. Waiter! Kavanaugh waved his hand for service. Anything for you, Diego? No, nothing. He couldn't hide the edge in his voice. A headache brewed at the base of his skull. The man was stalling. Yet with Brogan gone, Diego had no choice but to stick with Kavanaugh, his lifeline to the night's event. Otherwise, he'd be stranded without the price of admission. You may as well order a drink. I'm waiting on a call from Mr. Brogan. He left to make sure everything is set for your visit and that the inventory is secure and in good working order. Kavanaugh smiled. As soon as he contacts me, I intend to show you the extent of my trust in you. A show of good faith. And I'm sure Mr. Rivera will be very pleased with the outcome of our dinner engagement. Nothing like a little unfinished business for dessert, savoring the best for last. Wouldn't you agree? Diego had nothing to say, and everything to lose. This book is continued on Disc 6. No One Heard Her Scream by Jordan Dane continued. Disc 6. The Riverwalk, 10.45 p.m. Becca walked through her front door and flipped on lights, still wrapped in Sonia's story. Matt Brogan had known Isabel and Sonia when the girls were in high school. He had a history with them. But if that were the case, why didn't he show any sign of recognition when she handed over Isabel's school photo the day she first interviewed Kavanaugh? Granted, the bastard would have been a moron to raise his hand and admit he knew Isabel. After all, in Sonia's latest version of the truth, Brogan had a direct tie to Isabel. Prostitution and the rape of a young girl, maybe even murder. I'll take sleazeball perverts for 200, Alex, she sighed, too drained to deal with Sonia's mind games any longer. And why don't you throw in what's behind door number three while you're at it? She felt an ache in her shoulders as she set her gun, keys, and cell phone on the kitchen counter. Isabel's past was murky with innuendo and supposition. She wanted to see the girl as her brothers Rudy and Victor saw her. In her gut, she imagined Isabel to be more like Danielle, innocent of the seedy underbelly of this world and in need of saving. But with every step in her investigation, Becca unraveled a new side to the girl, each darker than the last. And still, none of them fit in her mind, not completely anyway. She poured herself a glass of scotch and glanced toward her window out of habit. Before the glass touched her lips, she put it down. The drapes were drawn. If Diego left the gift of a white rose, she had to take a peek outside to see it. Becca walked to her window and peered out. A white rose lay on her outside windowsill. Her heart pinged off her ribcage. A thrill of expectation mixed with a sudden tingle radiating over her skin. The ticklish sensation made her smile. Diego, she whispered in the quiet of her living room. She loved the way his name sounded like a melody she would hear years from now and always associate with this feeling. Saying his name would trigger the way she felt right now and a silly grin would not be far behind. Oh, girl. Becca looked down at her clothes and shrugged in a fleeting display of frustration with the timing of it all. Jeans, sneaks, and a white cotton shirt under a sweater vest with a wool sport coat. Urban and trendy, yes. Sexy and alluring, no. Not exactly the attire she had in mind for their evening together, but it couldn't be helped. Being practical and impatient, Becca wouldn't make Diego wait so she could change clothes. She prided herself on being a low-maintenance woman. Becca opened her window and stepped outside, the first rose in her hand. But as she looked up to the rooftop, where she expected to see her garden lights burning kilowatts, it was dark and no other roses trailed up the steps. What the hell? She turned and looked the other way. His path of white roses went down the stairs of the fire escape instead. With a crooked grin, she shook her head. What are you up to, Diego? One by one, she picked up the flowers as she made her way down the steps. When the path became obscure, with the roses near a hedge line, Becca raised an eyebrow. 
They led to the Riverwalk level and down a walkway toward a nearby pub. Silly boy, you could have quaffed your thirst at my place for free. She grinned and shook her head. With her mind set on picking up the next rose, Becca never saw it coming. As she crossed a narrow alleyway between her condo and the next building, an arm grabbed her around the middle and yanked her into the dark passageway, a crushing grip over her mouth. She jerked her body, hard, and screamed through the hand. Raking her nails across skin, she tried to pry the fingers from her mouth. Her feet kicked the air, flailing for a way to strike. A man. He raised her off the ground, not giving her a chance to gain a foothold. It all happened too fast. Deeper and deeper, he dragged her into the dark alley. Becca needed time. She needed someone to notice her desperate moves, hear her strangled call for help. She dug in her heels and kicked, straining against his grip. But the man had no trouble carrying her. A second man emerged from the dark and lifted her legs. Why wasn't the alley security light on? Becca remembered the light. It should have been burning. When she heard the crunch of shattered glass underfoot, she realized the overhead bulb had been broken. She'd been set up. Roses and all. Who knew about Diego's roses? Her heart sank, along with her remaining hope. Swallowed up by shadows, Becca had no chance of being noticed now. The sound of her screams still raged in her head, but she was losing her fight. Suddenly, she felt the jab of a needle in the soft flesh of her neck. It burned as it seethed under her skin. Becca had no time left. Struggling for air, she lost her ability to scream. Her lungs were on fire. Her body fell limp and heavy. To orient herself, Becca tried to focus on the lights of the river walk or cypress branches under the night sky, but she couldn't see details anymore. They blurred together, like the voices. People laughing and talking came in and out of her awareness. More of a dream. Eventually, the muffled voices dwindled to nothing more than white noise. Fading in and out of consciousness, Becca remembered hands on her body and being wrapped in heavy, smothering material. A moldy smell nearly suffocated her. They lifted her body, but Becca's arms and legs were dead weight, leaden and unable to move. Sounds and flashes of light swirled around her, flickering in and out like a candle in the wind. Her mind wavered in the twilight between awareness and dreams, captive to the drugs in her system, a cruel and torturous state of limbo. Was she truly awake or only hallucinating? Becca fought to hold her own, to stay on the right side of reality, but now she had no idea where that might be. Before the blackness won, her mind drifted to a distant time. She welcomed the soft light and the soothing quiet of it. She pictured Danielle's sweet face and imagined the fragrance of her warm skin. Sisters sharing a bed and napping together on a hot afternoon when they were kids so long ago. A fan whirred quietly in the background and blew cool air across their skin, back and forth. Danielle never woke up. Strands of her hair wafted in the breeze off the fan. Her eyelids flicked and fluttered with a dream, in contrast to the steady rhythm of her breaths. And Becca watched her sleep from two sets of eyes, as a young girl lying at her sister's side, and as the woman she had become. The odd vision filled her with an overwhelming peace. But out of context, Diego stood over them, smiling down as if he knew everything would be okay. Seeing him there, a profound serenity washed through Becca. He looked so beautiful in the afternoon light, so still and rock solid. She wanted to reach for his hand and whisper his name, but nothing would come. Chapter 15 Downtown San Antonio What? Say again. Draper squinted as he turned on the lamp, the cell phone to his ear. He yanked the covers off him and sat up in bed. His downtown hotel room came into focus, but his mind hadn't fully grasped the situation. That surveillance we had on Rebecca Montgomery. Our men are on the move. I just got the call, the man said. It happened too fast. Our guys weren't in a position to stop it. He recognized the voice of Paul Murphy, the SAPD member of his team. What happened? Start from the beginning. Draper stumbled to the bathroom to take a leak. We staked out her place down on the river. She wasn't home, so we waited. Murphy sighed into the phone, catching his breath. Becca got home around... He heard Murphy flip through papers, looking for details that didn't matter in the grand scheme of things. Uh, quarter to ten. We had a two-man team, one in front, the other in back. 
For whatever reason, Becca crawled out her fire escape window. I still don't understand why. In the absence of a three-alarm fire in the building, do you think she saw our guys? Maybe she tried to ditch them by going out the fire escape. Draper theorized as he shook himself and flushed. After performing a one-handed wash maneuver, he looked at himself in the mirror and ran his free hand through his graying hair, what was left of it. An ugly, skinny bastard stared back, same as always. No, I don't think so. Our guy said her leaving had something to do with flowers, sir. But it doesn't make any sense to me. I hear you, son. Women don't exactly come with logical instructions and a free set of kitchen knives. Making sense is not in their playbook. What else? Like I said, she was picking flowers. But some guy grabbed her from behind. He pulled her into an alley near a condo. Murphy's anxiety for his fellow officer gave an edge to his voice. The man was still short of breath. I had a cop in plain clothes near a footbridge across the river, looking into the back of her place. By the time this all went down, he radioed for help from his partner on the street level in front. But they lost her. Murphy cursed under his breath. Damn it. This was supposed to be a babesitting job. I don't know what happened. Stay focused. Where is she now? That's just it. We're not 100% sure. The cop out front had seen some movers who'd been there for an hour or so before all this happened. No company name on the outside of their truck, but he got pulled off to search for Becca. Him and his partner made it inside her place through the open window off the fire escape, but she wasn't there. Her gun, cell phone, and keys were on the kitchen counter. Murphy had fucked up a simple surveillance operation, but things could have been far worse. If the timing had been off even a fraction, the sons of bitches who kidnapped Rebecca might have panicked and made it a hostage situation in downtown San Antonio, a shootout for crying out loud. Yet another potential outcome plagued him on a personal level. If these alleged kidnappers were linked to Kavanaugh, as he suspected, his operation would have been blown, and most probably Galvin's life would have been forfeited. Draper felt like an asshole for thinking only of his case, but he had invested too much time to have it wiped out by some local wannabe fed. Hell, Galvin was already in the hot seat, hanging with Kavanaugh. Draper didn't need another complication. He blocked the thought from his head and listened to Murphy give his report. By the time my team got done searching, they remembered the movers in the small truck and hauled ass to the street level again. They were almost too late. The truck had already pulled from the curb. They only had enough time to scramble to their car and follow. Movers in the middle of the night? Does that make sense to you, Murphy? Because if it does, you can tear up your federal employment application. No, sir. It didn't. That's why my guys are tailing the truck as we speak. What now? Like my daddy always used to say, get on her and stay on her, son. This might be our only chance to nail that rat bastard Kavanaugh. Let's get more cars tail in the truck so we don't unzip our fly and let them know we're there. And gather up the rest of our team. I got a feeling this is it. We won't get another chance. But if they have Becca, we can pull the truck over right now. We've got probable cause to do the search, sir. There's a big picture, Murphy. You're thinking too small. Just do as I say. Squirming out of his pajama bottoms with cell phone in hand, Draper bellowed, And get over here to pick me up. I'll be in front of the hotel in five. It took a while for the cop to respond, but once he did, Draper heard the dissent in his voice. The man didn't agree with his order. Already on my way, sir. Make it three. Draper ended the call, his mind firing on all cylinders. In a rush, he ransacked his room for clothes, throwing on whatever he found. He made a big leap in logic to assume Kavanaugh had ordered the kidnapping of a local cop but it made sense given Diego's earlier warning. Gutsy and stubborn Rebecca Montgomery had wanted in on his case. Now she was, the hard way. He hoped she would live to appreciate the irony. And for Diego's part in all this, his simple favor on a hunch had turned out to be anything but simple. His prized informant had to know more than he let on at the bank. Diego's sudden concern for a cop he only just met was too much coincidence. But no matter how it happened, Draper didn't care. It all might end tonight with something more than the foothill of circumstantial evidence Diego had gathered so far. He was so close, he tasted it. Kavanaugh had taken a huge risk. No doubt the man had something special in mind for Rebecca. And with an ego the size of Texas, the son of a bitch would be front and center when it all went down. Draper knew it. Dressed and armed, he raced from his room with his blood hot from the thrill of the hunt. Kavanaugh was going down, no matter what he had to do to make it happen. Nearly midnight. A smothering stench assaulted Becca's nose. 
Numb with cold, she lay on a hard surface. Her shoulder blades and a hip bone ached from the clumsy position of her body. And she couldn't move, not even to open her eyes. Despite the foul air, she focused on her breathing. And she forced her brain to work at recognizing the staggering smell. It gave her something to concentrate on besides the pain. Dank mold mixed with the heavy musk of body odor, but the rank fumes of a broken sewer overpowered the melange. Little by little, she pierced the veil of fog in her mind. Minutes seemed like hours, but eventually, Becca became aware of her body convulsing. Tremors ripped through her muscles unchecked. Drugs still affected her system, and the chill off the floor didn't help. With great effort, she pried her eyes open. At least she thought they were. Everything looked dark. No shapes, no light, only inky black. Becca had no way of knowing where she was or if she was truly awake. She tried to swallow, but her mouth felt like cotton. Her tongue was thick and swollen. As the haze lifted, the room took shape. An eddy in gray surged with shadows, and a stabbing light centered above her head. She tried to raise a hand to shield her eyes, but her arm flopped to her side, limp. Her wrist banged against something solid, a sharp crack to her bone. Mm. She heard the sound, unsure it came from her. Becca's eyes burned, stinging with tears. She forced them open. A blinding white light filled the space. It hurt her eyes, like staring into a scorching desert sun, unrelenting and without mercy. That's when she heard the echo of footsteps. The sound skittered off walls and came at her from all sides. A slow terror welled inside, roiling from the pit of her stomach. Still, she couldn't focus. Even as her heart thrashed against her ribs, she fought to wake up, to move, to run, but nothing. You wake, darling. A man's voice, low and gritty. His body eclipsed the intensity of the burning white light. His shadow brought the chill back to her skin. Becca felt a finger across her cheek, and she flinched. His hand grabbed her chin and shook it. She blinked and forced her eyelids open to keep the image of the man in her brain. Come on, we only gave you a light dose. I don't have all night, and neither do you. His laughter jolted her awake. The man's face spiraled from the haze, coming to a screeching halt in front of her eyes. Matt Brogan. Becca pulled from his hand and shoved away, clumsy like a drunk on a weekend bender. You and me got some catching up to do, he grinned. I know we don't hardly know each other, but I got a real nice surprise if you're good. Wh- where? This place? She fought for each word. You don't need to know that. All you gotta do is be nice and do what I say. Then we can talk about my surprise. You like the roses I sent you? The Max isn't the only one who can buy his way into your pants. His revelation jolted her brain. Brogan knew about her and Diego? That meant Kavanaugh did, too. Becca sucked air into her lungs to regain her senses. Diego was in trouble. Before she could move, Brogan reached for her. In her dazed mind, his fingers undulated like a nest of slithering snakes. Becca jerked her head back, but he only laughed again and forced himself on her. Brogan's hand gripped her neck. When he had her attention, he let go and trailed down her body. He fondled her breasts with his fleshy hand. But when she raised her chin in defiance, without more of a reaction, Brogan pressed his luck and squeezed her nipple, hard. She gritted her teeth but didn't cry out. Becca had no intention of giving the man what he wanted. Oh, I can see you and me are going to get along just fine. He grinned, a sickening dead look in his eyes. I like a challenge, and rough is my favorite indoor sport. Becca let him grope her body through her clothes, staring him down as best she could. Nauseated, she wanted to throw up, but resisted the urge. Eventually, Brogan backed off, taking his short victory lap. He walked into the shadows with a swagger, chuckling under his breath. She knew she hadn't seen the last of him. Becca's mind raced with how she would play this guy. Scenarios competed in her head. And as her brain cleared, she searched the room for any advantage. In the shadows, she saw movement. Dim lights glowed in the distance. But with her eyesight still blurred, she couldn't make anything out. She heard voices, men and women, and the rattle of chains clanged against metal and dragged heavy on the floor. Who were all these people, and why were they in the dark? And the smell, how could they live like this? She pictured a rabble of homeless street people living in a sewer. 
but the sound that chilled her to the bone was the quietest of them all. Sobbing cries. Real agony festered bone deep like cancer. A vague whimper gained urgency, and Becca heard Brogan's gruff voice cursing. Chains dragged along the ground, and a large, shadowy shape lumbered toward her. A group, or just one man, she had no idea. When Brogan came into the pale circle of light, he yanked at the arm of a thin girl. Her blonde hair was matted and covered in filth, head down. From what Becca remembered of Diego's investigation into Kavanaugh and human trafficking, she began to understand what she was witnessing, playing out before her eyes. This was what Diego and Draper had been searching for, Kavanaugh's elusive stronghold. The bastard held abused young girls against their will, degrading and sexually assaulting them for money, all in the name of business enterprise. Becca couldn't stand it anymore. She heaved the contents of her stomach, bracing her arms under her where she sat. Nausea came, wave after wave, until she ached with the exertion. She tasted raw bile in her throat and smelled it in her nostrils, along with a mounting fear for her own safety, wallowing deep in her belly. When she looked up, Brogan stood over her, the sickly girl still at his side. Becca squinted into the light, the blonde's face coming into focus. I believe you two know each other. Brogan grinned and shoved the girl to the floor in front of her. Becca came face to face with the blonde groveling on the floor. She appeared too damaged and beaten to look her in the eye. But when she did, Becca swallowed her heart. Eyes wide and jaw open in shock, Becca stared into the face of her sister, Danielle. Oh, my God. Every fiber of her being shook. Danny? Brogan laughed. What? You look like you've seen a ghost. His sickening cackle filled the chamber. But Becca blocked him out to concentrate. Was this another hallucination? A cruel hoax? God wouldn't be so heartless. She wanted to believe that, but the delusion of the girl lingered amidst the carnage of this place, a persistent manifestation. With shaky fingers, she reached out to touch her gaunt face. In an instant, Becca knew. Her eyes brimmed with tears. Danny's wide blue eyes stared back, damaged and lost, but they belonged to her sister. Dirt smudges and tears streaked her sweet face. Her lips quivered, and she mouthed words Becca couldn't hear. She cradled Danny's cheeks in her trembling hands. Everything around Becca faded to nothing. Her sister collapsed into her arms, still disoriented and confused by the whole encounter, unsure who Becca was, but thankful for the tenderness. Her body rail thin and fragile. Danny would break if Becca pressed too hard. Oh, God. Danny, Becca cried and clutched her little sister to her chest. Is it really you? Please, God. Oh, honey, is it you? It's Becca. Don't you recognize me? Becca? She whimpered, her voice raspy and spent. I thought I'd never... She broke down, choked with emotion. Mom and I thought you were dead. The police found your blood in that motel room. So much of it. Mama? Danny gripped her harder. Where's Mama? She's... Okay, honey. She misses you. Becca could see Danny didn't comprehend it all. The motel room, the excessive blood, looking like a murder scene. Trying to explain would only confuse her more. But before Becca could reassure Danny, Brogan interrupted. The blood was my idea, he boasted. We took it from her over a period of time, collected enough to fake a real slaughterhouse. Once the media got a hold of her credit card trail and the bloody motel room, things died down, and it was business as usual for us. Us? This is Hunter Kavanaugh's organization, right? Like you don't already know. Galvin has been feeding you intel for a while now. What's he getting in return, huh? He yanked Danielle's hair and pulled her from Becca's arms. Her sister's cries tore open her gut. Danny grimaced, her face twisted in pain. She had little strength to resist his manhandling. Not anymore. The other day when I heard you two were sisters, I knew a family reunion was the way to go. I'm kind of an old softy like that, he bragged, chest out. The other day, when you heard... Becca asked. Brogan hadn't let on he recognized her when she visited the Kavanaugh estate. He could have discovered her connection to Danielle only recently and put two and two together, but the man didn't look like he excelled at math. No, 
Matt Brogan had no appreciation for the subtlety of mind games. He came at you head first and shoulder down. Someone told him about it and helped him figure out the puzzle, although she had her own thoughts on the subject. She wanted to keep Brogan talking. The more he yapped, the less likely he'd mess with Danny. Who told you about Danielle and me? Let's just say an old friend thought I should know. Before Becca got her head wrapped around his answer, two men grabbed her from behind. They yanked her up to stand on wobbly legs. On the edge of the light, they pinned her against a railing. Becca heard the sound of duct tape, and her arms and legs were strapped to the metal bars. Don't tape her mouth. Brogan grinned at Becca, giving an order to his men. I want to hear her scream when she sees what I'm going to do. She watched in horror as Danny cowered at Brogan's feet, under the light. He stroked the girl's head and grinned, his face distorted by shadows like a grotesque mask. A gruesome stage play was about to be played out. Don't hurt her, you bastard! Becca screamed, struggling to break free. I'll kill you! Anger sparked in her brain. She felt blood rush to her face and stars spun across her eyes. In the dark, Becca raged with a survivor's instincts, protective of Danielle. She knew Brogan intended to play a game using her sister in center ring while Becca watched, torture inflicted on them both. Her mind raced with schemes. Psychological tactics and her training in interrogations flooded her thoughts now. How would she work this? She had no margin for error. Danielle was expendable to Brogan. In the shape she was in, she had no value. If Becca didn't do this right, she could witness the murder of her sister before her very eyes, an ordeal more horrific than her nightmares over the past months. Neither of them had much chance of walking out of here alive. But even if it meant sacrificing her own life, Becca would pay the price for a second chance to save Danielle. Don't go there, Becca. Ain't gonna happen. She shoved the negativity out of her mind. Trussed up like a turkey before the slaughter, Becca didn't have many options. All she had left was her brain and her mouth. It would have to do. Becca had lost Danielle once. She wasn't going to let it happen again. A wedge of moon lit the night sky on a clear night. Bluish haze settled on everything like a fine powder glowing in the dark. Mike Draper, outfitted in his Kevlar vest and FBI windbreaker, raised night vision binoculars to his face and watched the warehouse at the end of the deserted street. The hot and muggy air clung to his skin like a second layer. Sweat trickled down his temple and from his armpits under his clothes. His gear was a necessity of the job, and he'd grown used to the weight and the heat it generated. Earlier, he had received a report on the truck connected to the alleged kidnapping of Rebecca Montgomery. It had been spotted driving into the underground parking beneath the warehouse. The driver had either keyed a code or punched an automatic opener to lift the heavy door to the delivery bay. He hadn't witnessed the event himself, but the SAPD cops tailing the truck had. Draper scanned the perimeter once more, listening to the muted crackle of radio chatter. He had his own FBI hostage rescue team in place and working with the SAPD's tactical team. The HRT officers had been briefed on the mission and provided the available intelligence on their target. Draper would oversee the tactical plan as the commander. He gave his officers their assignments and their respective areas of responsibility within the op. No man would leave his AOR unless Draper ordered it. His men were geared up with 10 millimeter Heckler & Koch MP5s night vision goggles, explosive charges to blow obstacles, and plenty of flashbangs for the element of surprise on entry. Draper had plenty of probable cause to enter the premises with weapons drawn. He believed the men inside were armed and dangerous with one or more hostages. Probable cause wasn't an issue, and no warrant would be required given this scenario. The stage was set for breach, bang, and clear. Now he waited. This was his jurisdiction. His case, his responsibility and his ass was on the line if it blew up in his face. The warehouse under surveillance looked no different from any of the other dilapidated shitholes in this section of town. Anyone driving by wouldn't notice it, but one thing really chapped his skinny white ass. He'd been in the area before, weeks ago, on a lead from Diego. That time it had been a deserted factory only blocks away. Sources reported activity in the old textile district regarding young girls— Repeat appearances of the same girls, all in the company of older men, clued the tipsters. In this dump of a neighborhood, such activity would stand out. The tips fit what Diego had fed to Draper. So close, but so very wrong. Fuck me over once, he muttered under his breath, vowing tonight would be different, but not twice. SAPD Tactical is waiting for the word, sir, 
Murphy walked up behind him, with Lieutenant Arturo Santiago at his side. The ranking officer for the SAPD looked like the calm before the storm. Draper caught the look of anxiety on Murphy's face. Guilt can eat a man alive if you let it undermine him. Draper didn't believe in guilt. Santiago, on the other hand, glared at him like a man with something to say. After Murphy left, and he was alone with the lieutenant, Draper was the first to speak. I expected to see your chief. Where is he? He's on his way. ETA seven minutes. Uh, he's not a happy man. Whether your chief is here or not, this is my op. I'm not jumping the gun. Rebecca's a trained police officer. She knows how this'll play out. He turned his back on Santiago. Then maybe she should clue me in because I didn't get the memo. Santiago stepped in front of him with eyes narrowed and voice raised. If there's a chance in hell she's in there, Rebecca's being held against her will. I believe a crime has been committed on one of my detectives, Draper. Hell, we've even got probable cause with the suspicious activity in and out of the condemned property this time of night. I might even be convinced I smell a meth lab from here. And if those missing girls are in there, the tactical units can treat this like a hostage rescue and do their jobs. That should be enough for you. Except Kavanaugh is the focus of my investigation. And because of those girls, it's my jurisdiction. I'm calling the shots here, and I say we wait to get him. Draper matched Santiago's tone. The bastard left the restaurant in his limo. He's coming here. Draper lied, or rather overstated his argument. His men were still tailing the limousine, and the warehouse seemed an unlikely destination given the direction in which it headed. But it was still too early to make the call, not with a man as cagey as Kavanaugh. But you don't know that, not for sure, the lieutenant replied. He could be heading home or grabbing a nice wedge of pie at Denny's for all you know. I think you got a bad dose of wishful thinking, and no amount of penicillin will make it go away. In fact, this whole investigation has got you messed up. You're obsessed with this guy. And your men are so filled with guilt over what happened to Rebecca, you'd rather blow my case to cover up your department's embarrassment. Admit it. Your guys blew her surveillance. Now back off, Lieutenant. Santiago pulled back and began to pace, his jaw tense. He wasn't done. The man wiped his brow and adjusted his SAPD ball cap. Turning on Draper for round two, he stepped in close and lowered his voice so the other men wouldn't hear. Let's examine this situation with some objectivity, if you can muster it. Santiago exercised his right to sarcasm. In actuality, you have no idea who these men are, the ones that took Rebecca. They may not even be linked to Hunter Kavanaugh. But for the sake of argument, let's make that wild-ass leap in logic. The police lieutenant adjusted his Kevlar vest, hoisting it at the collar. You know what Kavanaugh does with these young women. What do you think is going on right now with Rebecca? You think after those bastards gang rape her, she'll really give a rat's ass about your letter-perfect bust of Kavanaugh? The lieutenant seethed with anger and sarcasm, a side of Santiago Draper hadn't seen before tonight. Despite the man having a legitimate point, Draper stared him down out of habit. But he couldn't allow himself to think about what he said. Plenty of times he ordered good men to do their duty, only to see some carried away in body bags, and he delivered the bad news to their families. Being a lieutenant, Santiago must have had his share of the same. Any skirmish worth fighting had its casualties. Someone had to weigh the good with the bad and make the hard decisions. This time, it was his call. Next time, it might be someone else at the helm with him fitted for a body bag. Either way, he wouldn't shirk his duty. I don't know what's happening in there any more than you do. Draper refused to justify his judgment call. He had said all he intended to say, but Arturo Santiago hadn't. That's the point, Draper. You're satisfied with that answer. I'm not. The lieutenant gritted his teeth and took a step back. How do you live with that ego? You're a user, Draper, and I figured something else out, too. You and Kavanaugh have a lot in common. Staring at the lieutenant's back as he walked away, Draper swallowed and clenched his jaw. Santiago's words resonated deep in his craw. He would have thought more about the lieutenant's take on the situation, except a dark sedan rolled down the street, a Mercedes from what he saw. It turned onto the warehouse property, he shifted focus and dismissed Santiago from his mind. Who the hell is this? He muttered under his breath, holding the binoculars to his eyes. Barking into his comm switch, he ordered, I want to know who that is. Anybody catch a good look, report in. Draper wanted it to be Kavanaugh, but the man had left the restaurant in a limousine, not a Mercedes. His men still followed the luxury vehicle. He didn't like surprises. Damn it. With men waiting on his order, Draper reminded himself of two vital things. He didn't do guilt, and he had made his decision. He hit the switch to his comm set. Tech team leaders, 
No one moves without my order. I repeat, wait for my order. Chapter 16 Becca strained against the duct tape that bound her hands and body to the metal railing. Her heart hammered in her chest as she worked the tape with her weight. Matt Brogan kept an eye on her, but his real focus was Danielle. Under the stark light overhead, Danny looked washed out and so afraid. She lay sprawled on the cement floor, too scared to move. Brogan knelt over her with a knife in his hand. In the stillness, Danielle's fear echoed off the walls. Every gasp, every shiver made a sound. If others stood in the shadows, Becca couldn't hear them. They watched in cruel silence, witnessing the atrocity without lifting a finger. She had to do something to distract him from her sister. Tell me, how did a classy guy like Hunter Cavanaugh get into trafficking and prostitution? She prompted. I mean, he's got the money to invest in anything he wants. Why pick something so vile and despicable? It seems like such a bonehead move. He saw an opportunity to make real good money, that's why. A damned Mex Galvin acts so high and mighty, but do you think some lame merger with global enterprises has made the old man what he is today? Brogan raised his voice. No, I'm the one who asked him to step up into something better. I had the connections. He just took my advice. It was all me. She'd struck a chord. Under the heading of good news, Brogan was talking. But under the header for bad, she could list the same thing. Flexing his jowls the way he was and admitting to criminal acts, the man had no intention of letting them go. He had too much to lose. But Becca had no choice. She kept working the duct tape, keeping him engaged in conversation. Does Kavanaugh come down here often? I mean, who's he going to trust with an operation this size? Boss man leaves it all up to me. He trusts me to take care of... things. As he spoke, Brogan tugged at her sister's grimy t-shirt, a taunting move. Because I know what to do. Please. No. Danielle trembled, eyes wide in terror. I'll do whatever you want, but don't hurt me. It's not that simple anymore, sweet meat. In a steady and measured move, Brogan made his first cut. His knife ripped through her shirt. From the collar down the middle, it hissed. A high-pitched and abrasive sound, like fingernails on a chalkboard. Becca's mind raced with what to say next. Her breath caught in her throat when Brogan trailed the blade down Danny's breasts. She forced herself to think and remain calm when all she wanted to do was scream. Sounds like Kavanaugh's been playing this whole thing real smart. Her voice cracked. Brogan looked up and smiled at her. Yeah, that's what I said before. He's a real smart man. Knows a good thing when he sees it. Knows to steer clear of a disaster, you mean. Becca set her jaw, watching the look of surprise on his face. What are you talking about? Brogan let Danny go. Sounds like Kavanaugh's playing both ends against the middle. He's keeping this thriving enterprise going with you, but washing his hands of it in case the cops knock at his door. I'd say that's a real smart move. She took a gamble Kavanaugh hadn't set foot in this dump, and by the look on Brogan's face, she'd guessed right. It's not like that, he argued. I'm running the show here, but he wouldn't leave me hanging. I know too much. Exactly, she nodded. She had planted the seed of Kavanaugh's betrayal. Now she would test the waters with another approach. Earlier you told me an old friend gave you the connection between me and Danielle. I got a pretty good idea who told you. Only, she's not much of a friend. Brogan snapped his head in Becca's direction, seething but curious. Humor me. Tell me what you think you know. More like who, I know. Sonia Garza, she said. Recognition flashed across Brogan's face. In fact, I've met with her on more than one occasion, and she loves talking about you. You're lying. Sonia told me she saw you once, and she came to me right after. We met at some roach coach motel off Guadalupe Street, and we did a hell of a lot more than talk. That bitch knows better than to lie to me. Maybe she hasn't told you about our little meeting tonight. Becca definitely had his attention now. She told me about you raping her at the pool house years ago, and about you buying your girlfriend Isabel Marquez an expensive gold necklace back then. Brogan grimaced, then started to laugh. His intense curiosity vanished. What the hell had just happened? You don't owe jack shit. Sonia always wanted a piece of me. I never had to rape her to get it neither. And I don't know nothing about that other girl. What's her name? Sonia knew her, not me. But you got Isabel the necklace, the heart with the diamonds on it. Sonia said so. Becca tried to recapture the moment, but she'd lost Brogan. 
She tugged harder at the duct tape, panic setting in. She couldn't budget. I met with her tonight at the Cielo Vista Cinema parking lot. She said you might have killed Isabel seven years ago. You've got some imagination, lady, but you don't have all the facts. One of my guys tailed you to that theater, but he got spooked and took off when you turned the tables on him. So that much might be true. His voice low and threatening, Brogan was ready to blow, but Sonia knows I'd kill her if she told lies about me. Hell, I'm not taking credit for that dead bitch. Sonia knows what happened. And buying some bimbo and expensive necklace is not my thing. I got plenty of the big O right here. And what my bitches don't give me, I take. I don't need to pay for it with jewelry, shit. He wasn't buying any of her story. Brogan's face nodded in a sneer. You play me for some kind of fool, but I got a better idea. From here on out, every time you open your fucking mouth, I'm going to cut off a piece of your sister and feed it to you. Now, let me see what kind of rise I can get out of you. Brogan fondled Danielle's breasts and squeezed too tight. She cried out in pain, but the sound of her cry only fueled his lust. He lowered his lips to her nipple, sucking and biting until her sister couldn't stand it anymore. Please, don't, Danny wailed. Seconds bled into hours for Becca as she struggled against her restraints, helpless and unable to speak. But when she looked up, something caught her eye. Danielle had turned her head toward Becca, even as Brogan fed on her fear. New tears streaked her raw-boned face, but Becca saw something more. In a show of submission, Danny collapsed under Brogan's weight, submitting to his degradation one final time. And with her surrender, she fixed her precious eyes on Becca, eyes brimming with all the love she held in her heart. Her baby sister mouthed the words, I love you, in silence. Danielle knew she would die, and Becca could only watch it happen. Diego recognized the seedy neighborhood, making him more anxious. Some time back, he and Draper had raided an old textile factory nearby, thinking Cavanaugh had his girls stashed in it. At the time, he believed it to be another waste of energy and manpower. Not so much now. As their Mercedes pulled up to a loading ramp and a subterranean parking garage entrance, the driver hit a code into a keypad. The heavy door rattled as it lifted. With the noise and Cavanaugh's distraction, Diego peered out the rear window, he searched for any signs of Draper, but saw nothing. If the Fed had gotten his message, he should have stormed the garage with the door open like this. Why hadn't Draper gotten his message, damn it? There should have been enough time, but now things were looking bleak. It was probably too late. Cavanaugh had screwed him over with the FBI surveillance. The man switched cars, sending the higher-profile stretch limo on its way with two other passengers on board, no doubt with the FBI on its tail and Cavanaugh had taken the less conspicuous Mercedes of Brogan's. They had planned it from the beginning. When Diego saw the switch going down, he pretended it didn't matter. But inside, his brain struggled for another way to alert Draper. As he slid into the back seat of the Mercedes, with Cavanaugh giving last-minute instructions to one of Brogan's men, Diego had palmed his small cell phone out of his pocket. He shot a quick glance to its display as he held it close to his thigh, away from Cavanaugh's sight. With the cell muted, Diego thumbed 911 and hit send without a sound. But as the call went through, he slid the phone into the seat pocket next to him. No time for him to pass on a direct message. Too dangerous. A dispatcher would get the call and have to respond, whether he remained on the line or not. And with the GPS feature the FBI had installed on the phone, someone would eventually contact Draper and track his exact location. It wasn't much of a plan, but he had run out of options, especially after one of Kavanaugh's men held him at gunpoint from the front seat at the switch site, demanding his forty-five caliber Colt. Now with no gun, the sheath of knives strapped to his leg was all he had left. Diego stared into the dismal shadows of the garage up ahead. He was about to enter one of Kavanaugh's strongholds. You surprised me, Diego. Kavanaugh's voice caught him off guard. He hadn't spoken since the switch. You didn't ask one question about the switch in cars. Why is that? Before he answered, Diego remembered another phone call not so long ago. The recollection came to him not out of nostalgia, but from the harsh reality of his present situation. His death wish conversation with Kavanaugh. He didn't really know why he thought of it, or perhaps he did. One of these days I might surprise you and grant your death wish, Diego, the man had said. How prophetic, he thought. Diego hadn't resisted at the switch site for one reason only— if he had a chance to discover the location of the missing girls, he had to take his shot, despite the odds. He knew he'd be outnumbered, and if this was his day to die, he would refuse to go quietly or alone. 
he'd have his sights set on the man sitting next to him. Diego stared at Kavanaugh now, anger not part of the equation. Weren't we just talking about trust, Hunter? In a deliberate move, he used the man's first name. After all, death made all men equal. It seems one of us was listening, and the other scheming. I will miss our little chats, Diego. Kavanaugh smiled, a genuine show of humor in his eyes. So we lie. Diego lied. He felt no such affection for the man. Yet from here on out, subterfuge would no longer be necessary. Neither man would make the pretense of civility. Every remark would matter, and every word would be the truth. The warehouse door rumbled closed behind them with such finality, it devoured the moonlight and belched its foul air. But worst of all, it robbed Diego of his life with Rebecca. How long are you going to wait for Kavanaugh? Do the bodies have to pile outside the door for you to reconsider this so-called strategy of yours? Lieutenant Santiago had his hands on his hips and glared at Draper. The moon cast its light on half his face, the rest in shadow. Look, I've already had a long talk with your chief. He doesn't like the situation, but... Before Draper finished, his cell phone vibrated. He answered the call. Draper, you better have good news. Santiago watched his reaction with interest. We're outside the Kavanaugh estate. The limousine dropped two men off and split. What now? The voice of Special Agent Russo. Did you get a good look at the men? Was it Hunter Kavanaugh and Diego Galvin? We haven't been able to confirm that, sir. Embarrassment crept into Russo's tone. It might have been them. We couldn't get closer with the security they have on the grounds and at the gate. But with binoculars, we might... Draper interrupted him. I don't want you to risk getting spotted. Kavanaugh's men are armed, and they'd be within their rights to shoot first and ask questions later if you tried to infiltrate the place. He shut his eyes tight and heaved a sigh. The look on Santiago's face didn't help. Stay at the estate and out of sight. Report any activity. Draper out. After he ended the call, Santiago cocked his head to say, What? Don't your men have X-ray vision, or was the limo made of lead? The lieutenant took his cheap shot, but Draper had it coming. You've made your point. Not yet, I haven't, the lieutenant insisted. We still gotta figure out a way into that damned warehouse, one that won't get my detective and those girls killed if they're in there. My HRT unit found a way in the main level, stealth mode, but the stairways to the garage have been sealed off. A recent addition, by the way, he offered. Sealed off, Santiago asked. What kind of renovation concept is that for a condemned building? If they've done work like that, it's likely Kavanaugh or Matt Brogan are behind it, and hunkered down below ground. That's what I was thinking. He nodded. We'll have to blow the doors to gain access. Maybe first we'll need a little diversion out front to distract the bastards inside. Santiago grinned. Now you're talking, Draper. I haven't seen a problem yet that couldn't be solved with a little well-placed C4. Remind me not to go hunting with you. His cell phone buzzed again. Draper. He listened to the voice on the other end of the line. His jaw dropped and eyes narrowed. Draper gave his instructions and ended the call. You're not going to believe this. He fixed his eyes on Santiago. Dispatch got a 911 call from a phone I gave Diego Galvin, my inside informant. No one on the line, but it's still open. The cell's got GPS tracking on it. Santiago scrunched his face in question, not grasping if this was good news or bad. Dispatch tracked the signal to this location. Draper's heart ramped up a notch. Galvin is inside that damned warehouse sending up GPS flares. And I bet Kavanaugh is standing right next to him. This is going down. Now. Chapter 17 Only a matter of time. Brogan had a knife at Daniel's throat. Becca's sister strained to avoid the blade, chin high and veins jutting from her neck. The bastard trailed the weapon down her body, hovering over major arteries. One deep slice and she would bleed out in minutes. And Becca would be forced to watch it happen, he had stripped off most of Danny's clothing, leaving tattered remnants to hang from her limbs. Now the tip of his blade creased her sister's breast, so sharp it cut a thin white line that erupted in beads of blood and dribbled down her ribcage. Danny gasped and gritted her teeth against the pain. Becca rocked and tugged against the duct tape holding her down, not caring if Brogan saw. Her eyes stung with tears, and bile stirred hot in her belly, making her nauseous again. All she wanted was to talk to her sister for the last time, to tell Danny all the things she had dreamt about saying if she had a second chance. But if she did, Brogan would make Danielle's death excruciating. She knew it, and the pain of that knowledge ripped her apart. Brogan locked eyes on Becca, 
and a slow sneer spread across his face. He was only getting started, she saw it in his eyes as he unzipped his pants. Killing Danielle wasn't going to be enough. Such a despicable animal. I see you are well represented, Hunter. You should be very proud. A man's voice with a Hispanic accent came from deep in the shadows, accompanied by the heavy echo of footsteps. Becca peered into the dark, looking for the man who dared to speak against Brogan. Although her face twisted with a rage from deep in her soul, she dared to hope someone would intervene for Danny's sake. Behind Becca and all around, people lurked in the shadows and whispered. She sensed a stirring of urgency. At her back, the weight of their eyes closed in. Even Brogan raised his ugly head and squinted into the murky shadows. When the man with the mystery voice stepped into the light, a flood of emotion swept over her. Diego, oh my God. Dressed in an elegant suit, he didn't belong to this squalid and depraved world. And seeing him reminded her that another life existed beyond this hell, the promise of a future. But Diego wasn't alone. Hunter Cavanaugh stepped from the dark and stood at his side. The privileged man grimaced with obvious disdain as he looked around. Repulsed by the world Brogan thrived in, the interruption diffused Brogan's fury, and he scrambled off the floor, zipping his pants up. In an uncontrollable show of relief, Becca let her body go slack. She collapsed against her restraints, drained and exhausted. Maybe the nightmare would be over. Yet when reality struck, Becca knew this couldn't be true. Diego stood next to Kavanaugh as a free man, but two men hemmed him in, only waiting for Kavanaugh to give the order to restrain him. He would suffer their same fate, and her heart sank with a deep and pervasive regret. Earlier, Brogan told her Kavanaugh knew about Diego's visits to her, and assumed he was talking to the local cops, and her interference with the blackmail attempt on Diego had gotten him noticed by the wrong man. The rich bastard and his obscene disciple had won. Before she knew it, the words were out of her mouth. I'm so sorry, Diego. I didn't mean for this to happen. At the sound of her voice, Diego jerked his head to the right. His beautiful Rebecca. Duct tape bound her to a railing, and her eyes pleaded for him to help, tears shimmering down her face. What? What's going on here? He questioned. Why is she? He looked for an answer in Kavanaugh's face, but the man only smirked, a sickening reminder of his twisted nature. Finally recognizing the scene for what it was, Diego shifted from Rebecca to the young girl near Brogan. When he saw the face of the blonde, he knew it had to be Danielle. He recognized her from Draper's files. Oh my God, this can't be. Danielle is alive. His mind grappled with the shock, but another realization hit with a powerful jolt. Brogan had set this up. Rebecca and Danielle. And Kavanaugh had known about it. His big surprise. Brogan's phone calls, the whole fucking dinner had been orchestrated for this vile finale. While they ate, Rebecca had been subjected to a living hell, with Danielle only feet away. It all came in a rush. His heart hammered and his throat wedged tight and choked off his air. Brogan's torture of these two women spiraled him into a seething rage. Diego shook with it. He felt an angry fist at his heart, threatening to rip it from his chest. Something snapped inside him. You pathetic coward, he yelled. Diego raced for Brogan. He grabbed him by the scruff of his neck, and with all his weight behind it, he pounded his fist into the man's gut, over and over. Even with Brogan being the heavier man, Diego lifted him off the ground with every punch. Adrenaline fueled his frenzy. Voices in the dark shouted garbled words he couldn't understand. The mass of bodies closed in, the circle of light growing smaller, suffocating and oppressive. Ah, ah! Brogan grunted and moaned. Get him off! No amount of punishment would ever be enough for Rebecca, for Danielle, for every one of the missing girls. Their faces raced through his brain at a fevered pace. Diego couldn't stop. He battered the man out of control. The injustice, the years stolen from him because these men bartered with human life as if it meant nothing. Blind rage had taken over, and a dark side of Diego's soul emerged, a side Kavanaugh had fostered. That's enough! Kavanaugh bellowed, pull him off. Diego shoved Brogan against a wall. When his fist connected with the bastard's face, hands tugged at his arms. A man shoved into his ribcage with a dropped shoulder to back him off. Two men grappled him into submission, but Diego fixed his eyes on Brogan, nothing else. It took you long enough. Brogan glared at Kavanaugh, panting. Quite frankly, I had hoped you would rebound, Mr. Brogan. 
The man knew how to twist the knife. No one's ego was sacred. And the viciousness of Diego's attack. I found it astounding. Diego glared at Kavanaugh, his body shaking, still in the throes of his brutality. Brogan hunched over and spat blood on the floor, heaving with hands on his knees. The aftermath of his beating still echoed through the chamber, but the angry voices had trailed off, waiting for what would come. When Brogan rose, his face swollen and battered, he scowled at Diego with a new scale of hatred. I'm gonna, he spat again and wiped his mouth with a sleeve. Take pleasure in killing you. Real slow mix. Big talk for such a small, insignificant man. Diego wrestled against the men who held him. His rage smoldered, a sustained burn, unappeased. Kavanaugh intervened. The stark light overhead cast shadows across the features of his aristocratic face, giving him a death-like pallor, a macabre master of ceremonies. As you know, Diego, I do not tolerate disloyalty. Clearly, you are working with the police. You know Detective Montgomery quite well. Kavanaugh gestured with a wave of his hand, pointing to Rebecca. I can only assume your fascination with her would not be in the best interest of Mr. Rivera or myself. So consider what comes next your severance package. Mr. Brogan, he is yours as I promised. Brogan stood and flexed his shoulders. He torqued his head to one side and popped his neck. Slowly he walked toward Diego. The men grasping his arms reinforced their grip. Diego steeled himself for the beating, his stomach taut. You won't get away with this, he argued, glancing over at Kavanaugh. Joe Rivera won't stand for it. Now there, you are wrong. As Mr. Rivera's new business partner, I am only protecting his interests along with my own. Kavanaugh beamed. You see, Brogan interrupted the man's gloat by taking his first punch. He rammed his fist into Diego's gut, doubling him over. But the men yanked him back up. Rawr. Diego grimaced and taunted his abuser through gritted teeth. Is that all you've got? Brogan fumed, his eyes dark and menacing. He stepped to one side and pounded Diego's ribcage, each blow aimed to break bones. No, please, let him go, Rebecca screamed. He heard her sweet voice through the haze. Kavanaugh continued, as if he were at a cocktail party speaking about the weather. Well, yes, I'm afraid that's going to leave a mark. Oblivious and smiling, Kavanaugh walked around Brogan as he pummeled Diego with beefy fists over and over. As I was saying, I've planted some very incriminating evidence on a computer at the estate and in your quarters. When your employer finds out about it, he will be grateful to me for heading off a disaster. Rivera won't... Diego forced the words from his mouth. He won't believe you. Brogan planted a fist to his jaw, jolting his head back. He saw stars, tasted blood. A warm stream dripped down his chin. Of course he will, my dear boy. I've thought of everything. Kavanaugh caught Brogan's eye. Without a word, he stopped the man's assault with a glare. For the time being, Diego had his reprieve. He slumped in the grasp of the two men, his legs wobbly from the vicious beating. Kavanaugh carried on. You see... This despicable trafficking business will appear to be all your idea, and you've done splendidly so far, financially speaking. A rather lucrative account has been set up under your name in Switzerland, the Swiss Credit Bank in Zurich. All confidential, of course, but the paper trail will lead back to you, and with the rush on setting it up, the police might assume you intended to leave the country in a hurry. Imagine that. But the police... Diego shook his head to clear the fog, his throat parched. Rebecca, the police will figure you've been feeding them bad information only to protect yourself. Can you imagine their embarrassment? And of course, this brave detective over here will try to stop you getting killed in the process, but not before killing you first. A nice tidy package for the police to uncover. Case open, case closed. Diego pushed himself to stand. He raised his chin, mustering a defiance he had to fake. Very clever. Local cops might buy that, but Rivera. Kavanaugh grinned and shook his head. Mr. Rivera will want to make it up to me for strapping our new enterprise with such a miscreant. Game, set, match, Mr. Galvin. Rather clever, don't you think? It would be, except for a couple of minor points. 
Diego gulped air into his burning lungs. He licked the blood off his swollen lip. Kavanaugh furrowed his brow in question. Such as? Brogan shrugged with a snort, and from the corner of his eye, Diego saw Rebecca stand at attention. During the brawl, Danielle had crawled to her sister. Now she clutched at Rebecca's clothes, her eyes wide and fixed on the unfolding drama. Diego had nothing left to lose. Unlike the old saying, the truth would not set him free. But it would give him great satisfaction to know he had removed the smug look from Kavanaugh's face with surgical precision. He chose his next words carefully. My interest in the local police is purely personal. He glanced to Rebecca and summoned a painful smile. But the FBI is another matter entirely. What? Kavanaugh's jaw dropped, his face priceless and worth all the pain Diego had endured. You can't be. While the man staggered with that bit of news, Diego hit him with a combination punch. And Joe Rivera is not just my employer. He's my father. And I assure you, he would not question my loyalty in this lifetime or any other. Oh, my God. The old bastard stumbled backward. He glared at Brogan, who only shrugged and stammered, I didn't, didn't know, boss, I swear. The men holding Diego loosened their grip. He pretended not to notice, but tensed his body to move. Let me kill him for you, boss, I, I can... Brogan hadn't recovered, but his mouth shifted into autopilot. Haven't you done enough, Brogan? Give me some time to think. Kavanaugh ran a hand through his hair, his skin taking on the ashen color of his hair. He paced in and out of the light. I just have to... Diego saw it in the man's face. Kavanaugh knew his scheme had backfired. His only prayer for survival would be if the FBI got to him first. Rivero would not be as generous. Even if Kavanaugh walked out of here alive, he was a dead man. Suddenly, an explosion ripped through the cavernous space. One, two, three loud booms. Each blast shredded the stagnant air with a percussive shockwave. Move! 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 Voices bellowed. A distant assault on a level above. Another one sounded closer. They came from nowhere and everywhere. At the threshold of the garage tunnel to the right, several metal canisters clattered across the cement floor. Diego saw them but had no time to react. In seconds, each one detonated. A brilliant flash of light and a deafening blast buffeted his body with a violent pulse and left him dazed. The roar rang in his ears, leaving him deaf. Ah! Diego covered his face, too late, and toppled to the floor. His head ached from the jarring concussion. Stars pierced the darkness and spun out of control, a blinding assault. Diego couldn't see. His night vision was gone. Even in his stupor, he knew what had happened. Police tactical teams used a diversionary device called a flashbang, a fuel-air explosive. The device reacts with oxygen to produce an acoustic pulse and a brilliant flash of light. Anyone within range is dazed, seeing stars and unable to hear. What followed the diversion played out before his eyes like a horror film in silent mode. Shadowy figures seethed through the maze, ghost-like silhouettes. Hard to tell the feds from Brogan's men. Flashlight beams strafed the walls, creating an eerie strobe effect. Bleary-eyed, he could only watch. Both of Brogan's men clung to him. They fired their weapons into the crowd, not taking aim. Maybe they figured to use him as a human shield. Diego's ears popped from the repercussion of the explosions, in and out. Angry voices were muffled. He couldn't hear the words. Another series of blinding lights tore through the darkness, sudden bursts of white. Diego staggered with the second assault, his equilibrium shaken. He thought the men holding him had gone, but he felt their grip again. Their faces shaken, the men were unsure what to do. Shots rang out as Brogan's men recovered one by one and scrambled for cover, firing their weapons. In a flash of recognition, Diego spotted Kavanaugh's white hair across a ramp. The man's face was twisted in panic, and Brogan rushed to his side. Kavanaugh yelled something to Brogan, but Diego only heard the incessant ringing in his ears, a steady numbing hum. Thud, thwack, zing. Bullets smacked against the wall behind him. Diego ducked. Stay right, stay right, move! A man dressed in tactical gear shouted to his team. Stacked one behind the other, Draper's men moved as one unit, with weapons aimed and ready. They pressed their advantage, superior numbers and better equipment. But Brogan's men opened fire. Mass confusion and the surge of another standoff. 
Diego wanted to shout and urge the feds to take down Kavanaugh and Brogan. Without a head, the snake would wither and die. But Brogan's men shoved him against a wall and forced him to move down another ramp, away from the fight. Diego craned his neck, looking for Rebecca on the level he had left behind. The captive girls screamed and huddled together in the dark, staying low. The last time he had seen Danielle, she was clinging to Rebecca. Her eyes brimmed with tears and insane fear. But now, the girl cowered in a corner, hands over her head, close to hysteria. The sharp staccato of bullets covered up her screams. Now or never, his chance to make a move. Diego shoved into one of the men holding him and knocked the man backward. In the dark, he heard the man's head crack on the cement. Turning, he jammed the heel of his hand into the solar plexus of the other, punching the wind from his lungs. The man doubled over, and Diego finished him with an elbow to the back of his skull. He was out for the count. Finally free, Diego took a gun from the unconscious man sprawled at his feet and checked his ammunition. He had half a clip. The other guy was nearly empty. He grimaced at his luck. To help Rebecca and Danielle, he had to go back the way he had come. He shrugged out of his suit jacket, yanked off his tie, and tucked the gun at the small of his back. Crouched at the top of the ramp, he retrieved a knife from the sheath strapped to his leg and waited to make his move for Rebecca, to set her free. Ay, Dios mío, he sighed, still hearing gunfire. Without thinking, Diego tapped the knife tip shoulder to shoulder, head to heart, making a quick sign of the cross. With a grimace, he hoped God would not be too offended by his irreverent use of the blade. Sorry, don't forget, it's the thought that counts. He forced his legs to work, creeping along the wall, hunkered down low. The smell of cordite hung heavy in the air. Diego felt his way in the dark and almost stumbled over a dead body, one of Brogan's guys. The man's chest was soaked in sticky blood. Diego didn't have to check for a pulse. He wiped his hands on his pants, but the smell lingered. Copper sweet blood and excrement made for a powerful brew, hard to forget. More gunfire erupted, a short burst from what remained of Brogan's men. Bullets ricocheted and blasted a hail of cement shards off the walls. He ducked the flying debris. Members of the tactical teams were already herding the girls to safety, one by one, shielding them with their bodies. A slow but effective process. In the dark and under fire, it was difficult to tell friend from foe. Up ahead, Diego spotted Kavanaugh. Draper's men were gaining an advantage, a fact not missed by the man with ashen hair. He saw it in his eyes and knew Kavanaugh would bail like a rat abandoning a sinking ship. With jaw clenched, Diego fixed his eyes on the man and pulled his gun, ready to close in. But the cold-hearted son of a bitch hadn't missed his intentions. Reloading his weapon and pocketing another clip, Kavanaugh yelled to Brogan. The two men split up. Where the hell are they going? Kavanaugh headed down a long, dark corridor, away from the strike force, and Brogan dissolved into the shadows in the opposite direction. A handful of his men retreated with him, and the gunfire on the ramp stopped. Damn it! Diego cursed. He wanted to follow, but as he looked over his shoulder, Diego stopped cold. On the fringe of light, Rebecca caught his eye and held it. A single tear rolled down her cheek, a contrast to the fragile and brave smile on her face. Vulnerable, and yet so very strong. In that instant, she stole his breath, reminding him of their first kiss. Even amidst the fading clamor of Draper's invasion, he stood spellbound and unable to move. If they lived through this day, Diego knew he'd always remember the significance, the moment he realized he loved Rebecca Montgomery. Are you okay? He asked, unsure he had spoken at all. When she nodded, he made himself move. Diego wedged the gun at his back and headed for her with knife in hand. He cut away the duct tape. And as he freed her arms, Rebecca ran her fingers over his face and down his throat to make sure he was real. An intimate and endearing touch. I'm so sorry, she cried. I didn't mean to drag you into this. When she was free, Diego pulled her to him. With the woman he loved cradled safe in his arms, he knew what it felt like to be a drowning man thrown a lifeline. No more regrets, Rebecca. It's time to move on with our lives, with our future. Kavanaugh has taken too much from both of us. I refuse to give him any more. He cupped her face with a hand and kissed the tears from her cheeks. And you have your second chance with Danielle now. An unbelievable gift. At the mention of her sister's name, Rebecca searched the floor for her sister. She peered through the shadows but found nothing. She pulled from his arms, desperation etched deep on her face. Where is she? Oh my God, she was right here. Danny's gone she cried. Maybe she was taken with the rest, he speculated, 
But even as he said the words, he didn't believe it. Come on, I've got to find her. Rebecca grabbed his hand and turned, but when he didn't follow, she stopped. What's wrong? You find Danielle. She's probably safe and sound already. You're going after him, aren't you? She squeezed his hand, horrified expectation on her face. Let Draper handle this. Please, come help me find Danny. Diego wanted nothing more. But if Danielle wasn't with the other girls, Kavanaugh had her. And he wouldn't rob Rebecca of hope or put her through the torture of watching her sister be threatened again. He had no time left. He had to move now. With his eyes fixed on Rebecca, Diego shook his head and let go of her hand. I gotta do this. He winced and swallowed, putting on a show of certainty he didn't feel. Go, find your sister, and know you've been blessed with a second chance. Diego turned and walked into the shadows. When he was sure she could no longer see him, he looked back. Rebecca hadn't left. She stood at the crossroad of indecision, still watching him go. Even as a feeling of dread crept into his heart, he wanted to remember how she looked, standing under the light. But most of all, he prayed he wasn't right about Danielle. This book is continued on disc seven. No One Heard Her Scream by Jordan Dane continued. Disc seven. Chapter 18 Brogan knew that Kavanaugh blamed him. The man had grabbed the flashlight and walked up front in silence, not caring if he and his men kept up. Bossman's behavior made him look bad in front of McPhee and Ellis. Who was the one installed the coated hatch at the lowest level of the damned garage, a sure way out if things got hairy? Not many people knew about the old tunnel system, some historical piece of crap forgotten a long time ago, a little bribe money to a city engineer and he had hit pay dirt. All he needed to do was remove a section of wall in this garage to connect to it, and he looked like a genius, except to Kavanaugh right now. But grabbing a hostage would be his ace in the hole, especially the cop's sister. For such a skinny little thing, the blonde chick squirmed in his arms and weighed a ton. He still had his hand over her mouth, but after the brawl with the mechs, his muscles ached, and he felt a sharp pang in his side, maybe a broken rib. It hurt like a mother. But did the little bitch appreciate his aches and pains? Hell no. Women. You're gonna fucking walk now, he hissed in her ear. But if I hear a whine or snivel, I'll slit your throat and make an ashtray out of your head. You understand me? She whimpered, but stopped struggling. I said, do you understand, bitch? He spat. I ain't no mind reader. The girl nodded, a fierce shake of her head. The fear in her eyes told him she believed what he said. Dumb broad. Sure, he'd slit her throat, but a damned ashtray? Unfucking believable. Brogan stood her on her feet and grabbed her by the hair, keeping her close. From the corner of his eye, he caught McPhee mocking him. The asshole pretended to puff on an invisible cigarette and flicked ashes on top of the girl's head when she wasn't looking. Ellis grinned, the bastards. Brogan glared at his men, but they only shrugged and scrunched their faces in silence. Up here to the right, boss, that far wall. Brogan pointed with his free hand, but Kavanaugh never turned around. Boy, was he pissed. The key code. I presume you have it, or will this be another pathetic hunt for the Holy Grail? The code? Bossman wanted the key code for the passageway. Brogan was sure he heard that part right. But with the echo in this dump, the rest sounded garbled. Kavanaugh said something about a hunt for quail. Fine time to be thinking of birds and such. These educated types never made sense to him. Most of the time, he ignored the hell out of them. A good policy, like now. He gave Kavanaugh the code. But if a man wanted to go hunting... He'd be doing it on his own. And have you thought of transportation away from here, or will we be thumbing it? Kavanaugh laid on the sarcasm. No, I got us a car. It's locked, but the key is in a magnetic box fixed inside the left back wheel well. It's parked inside the other building. An old tunnel connects to it. Pretty good, huh? Yes, I see you've thought of absolutely everything. How could I have ever doubted you? Okay, Brogan knew that tone. He stopped and shoved the girl into Ellis's chest. Look, we're gonna... Shh, uh, I thought I heard something, McPhee whispered, pointing a finger behind them. Quiet like this, the hollow sound played tricks on your head. Four men and a scrawny girl made their share of noise, but when they stopped, McPhee heard something. It could be just another echo, or... Brogan felt a presence more than heard one. He grabbed the light from Kavanaugh's hand and doused it, and he wrestled the girl from Ellis and clamped a hand over her mouth. No sounds unless I tell you to, or I'll kill whoever is out there, then you next, 
he whispered to the girl. And to his men, we're going fishing, boys, spread out. And watch a crossfire. If I end up with a ricochet bullet in my head, I'm going to be real pissed. Now move. Brogan pulled the handgun from his belt and yanked the girl tight to his chest. Damn it. He was having a really crappy day. Diego had made some ground, but the sounds of footsteps he followed suddenly stopped. Had they gotten to their destination? And where the hell was that exactly? This section of the old garage was a maze. Going deeper into it made no sense. He didn't have a flashlight, fearing it would only act as a beacon to give his location. Diego relied on his night vision and the noise he trailed, but now the footsteps had stopped. He was dead in the water. Should he move and risk making a sound or stay put until they got going again? Ah! Ah! The shriek of a girl rebounded up the ramp. Please! Ah! The last part faded into a hiss like a whisper in a well. Diego's heart clenched in his chest. He pressed his back to a wall and moved toward the sound, using a hand to guide him in the dark. His other held the gun. As he made his way, he assessed the situation in his mind. For starters, he'd pay big bucks for running shoes and toss these custom-made Italian loafers. No offense, Raviello. But he didn't dare slip them off and ditch them. No telling what surprises he might find on the floor in this section of the garage. His fingers felt a corner. He stopped and edged closer for a look. But before he got near enough, a faint light shone from below. He ducked and held his breath. The light cast a dim glow into the section of ramp where he crouched. The beam shifted, jerky then steady, manipulating the elongated shadows like ebony marionettes. Diego would have stayed put, but hearing a crying woman played havoc on his protective instincts. It had to be Danielle. Even if it wasn't, he had no choice but to check it out. He inched his way to the corner and cocked his head left for a look. Danielle stared up the ramp, catching his movement. A flashlight lay on the cement near her feet, the source of the light. It rocked in place like she'd kicked it. Her hands were tied to a section of pipe. The rest of her body sprawled on the floor, a gag stuffed in her mouth. When she saw him, she yanked at the pipe in a panic. She pulled at the bindings on her hands and let out a muffled scream. Maybe the poor girl thought he was one of them and would hurt her. To be safe, Diego peered through the thin fringe of light into the shadows. No sign of Brogan or Kavanaugh and a door to the far right was ajar. Damn it, they had escaped. Would Draper know about this exit? He stood and stepped quietly down the ramp, gripping his gun in a two-fisted grip. With his back to a wall, he searched for movement as he made his way toward her, eyes alert. He pointed his gun into the shadows at every point he was vulnerable from attack, searching for Kavanaugh and Brogan, behind old crates and discarded oil barrels. The nooks and crannies in this section were pitch black, it was like staring into a bottomless vat of crude oil, but nothing. In his mind, it made sense that they were gone. Kavanaugh would want a head start to leave the country and find a safe haven with no extradition, but Brogan was unpredictable. As he got closer, Danielle appeared even more agitated. Poor little thing. It broke his heart. She had survived so much. No child should have to know such a hell existed, and yet she had endured it. A casualty. Her innocence and sense of safety had been shattered, never to be restored. When he got close enough, Diego held up his hand to calm her. Shh, I'm here to help, he whispered as he knelt by her. Setting the gun on the floor next to him, he retrieved one of his knives strapped to his leg. I'm a friend of your sister, Rebecca. Oh, I'd say you and her sister much more than friends. Brogan's voice came from behind him. More like two fucking dogs in heat, the bitch and the mongrel. Diego stopped cold holding his breath. Shit. Without making a move, he shifted his eyes down to his gun. Could he grab it and turn fast enough? But another sound to his left complicated everything. A crunch of dirt underfoot. Someone else in the room. Kavanaugh? Diego couldn't hit two targets from a crouch with his back turned. He swallowed, his throat parched with tension. Stooped by Danielle, Diego stayed put. He gambled Brogan wouldn't shoot him in the back. The bastard would want to see the look on his face as he died. So predictable, so very brogan. Remember what I said a while back about the actions of a wise man. A smart man turns and walks away. Why are you still here, brogan? Feds are crawling all over the building. Before long, they'll have this entire sector of the city under lockdown. I thought you and Hunter were smarter than that. We are. That's why we have three guns pointed at your head. Brogan gloated. Three? Diego shut his eyes and took a deep breath. He glanced down at Danielle. Even with the gag in her mouth, 
Her eyes said it all. His chance of saving her had blown up in his face, and she knew it. What now? Stand with your hands raised, but don't turn around, Brogan ordered. Diego heard noise behind him, coming from other parts of the room. When he did as he was told, Brogan added a new wrinkle. Now turn around, real slow, and kick your gun to one of my guys, nice and easy. Diego palmed the knife in his hand and turned around. With his foot, he slid the gun to the nearest man. Kavanaugh stood next to the open hatch on the left. He had probably been hiding in the shadows on the other side of the door. When Diego locked his gaze on the man, Kavanaugh couldn't resist a smug remark. Glad you gave us one last shot at you, so to speak. Very considerate. Two of Brogan's men stood opposite each other, with one stepping out from behind a group of barrels. Straight ahead, Brogan emerged from a niche in a wall. The one flashlight on the floor kept them in shadows. Now all eyes were on his gun, but it wouldn't take them long to see he had something wedged in his hand. Diego wanted to keep Brogan talking, but windy old Kavanaugh was his best chance. Leave this sickly girl, Hunter. She'll only slow you down. Take me instead, he offered. Now, why would I do that, Diego? Kavanaugh stepped closer. You might get away from here. Although with time ticking, you are losing any advantage you may have. But this girl won't keep Rivera off your ass. Not like I would. Kavanaugh considered his point. He narrowed his eyes and pondered the notion. Brogan sneered, no doubt loving the idea of a slow torture when the bastard had more time. The other two men looked at each other, questioning the rationale of switching a weak girl for a man who could defend himself. But it wouldn't be their call. You have always impressed me with your eloquence and logical thinking. Kavanaugh stepped closer, near the edge of the light. But I've got one problem with your proposition. Diego shifted his gaze to Kavanaugh. What's that? Quite frankly, I'd prefer to know you're dead. And as for your old man, screw him. Your riddled body will serve as notice. Our merger is terminated. He turned and headed for the open hatch door. Mr. Brogan, fire when ready and put that sniveling girl out of her misery. Mr. McPhee, you're with me. Three guns are a bit overkill, don't you think? Kavanaugh stepped through the doorway, with McPhee on his heels, and bellowed over his shoulder, Mr. Brogan, you and Ellis join me on the other side of this tunnel. Don't dawdle, you know how I hate to wait. Kavanaugh disappeared into the dark and never looked back. The coward. Now Diego settled his eyes on Brogan, the last face he would ever see. Diego lowered his arms and crossed them over his chest, the knife in his grip. Hey, no one said you could move. Brogan protested. What are you going to do? Shoot me? Diego took a deep breath. You wouldn't deny a man his dignity, would you? The way I'm going to leave your bodies? Dignity will be the last thing you'll have. With Brogan's snide comment, the other men grimaced and shrugged. Come on, Matt. We don't have time for this. You know the old man ain't going to wait for us. We got to go. Brogan clenched his teeth and shot a nasty glare at his man. Ellis is right. Rude and an asshole, but he's got a point. We got a ride to catch. Believe me, I wish we had more time. Brogan sneered and raised his gun. Diego tensed his body. No time left. He stepped in front of Danielle and gripped the knife, ready to move when... Freeze! Lower your weapons! Rebecca stood at the top of the ramp, gun in hand, locked and loaded with a double-fisted grip, and she had never looked more beautiful. Brogan refused to budge and never lost sight of his target. He held his ground, his gun aimed at Diego, center mass. I ain't moving, lady. Looks like we got a Mexican standoff here. But since I'm such a soft-hearted guy, I'm gonna give you a choice. Kavanaugh wants the Mex dead, so I got my orders. But as far as your sister goes, I'm leaving that up to you. What's it gonna be? He chuckled, his focus on Diego. I kill the Mex and we part company. Your sister goes home with you. You play this any other way, and your precious sister is the first to go. To his man, he ordered, You hear that, Ellis? The Mex can't protect the girl from both of us. She's your new target. His man shifted his aim to Danielle. Things had gone from bad to worse. Becca hesitated, her eyes on Diego. He stood with such confidence, arms crossed and defiant. And Danielle sat rigid against the wall, strangely quiet and cowering in Diego's shadow. Becca gritted her teeth. 
No way Brogan would get his way. But when she looked back at Diego, he returned her stare and shrugged. Sounds like a deal you shouldn't refuse, Rebecca. It all happened so fast Becca didn't see it coming. Diego flung an arm. Something left his hand. A loud, heavy thump. Brogan was still smiling when the blade hit. He cried out and sputtered, staggering back with a knife jutting from his chest to the hilt. He gaped down at it in disbelief like he'd sprung a new appendage. Danielle cried out. The pitiable sound of her muffled scream gripped Becca, wrenching her gut with fear for her sister. Shocked by what happened, the other man gaped at Brogan and hesitated long enough for her to react. Gun down, now, or you're dead, she cried out. The man named Ellis didn't lower his gun. She knew the twitchy, aggressive look. He wouldn't be arrested. The bastard was only waiting for his chance. Becca rushed down the ramp to throw Ellis off and take him out of the equation. But Brogan reeled, still on his feet, a macabre and bloodied puppet. Becca kept her options open. She stood within a yard of Ellis, his back to her. The man watched her from the corner of his eye, waiting for her to make a mistake. She gripped her weapon, her palms slick with sweat. Her eyes shifted to watch Brogan and Diego, but Ellis turned his head, a subtle flinch to keep her honest. She countered as he did, a deadly game of chicken. Why hadn't Diego moved? In reflex, Brogan stumbled forward and raised his arm, ready to fire. A look of shock forged on his face. Diego had a slim chance. He might have rushed him, gotten to the bastard before he fired his gun, but he chose to cover Danny, defenseless, shielding her sister with his body. Oh my God. Becca's heart pounded and her chest heaved. Damn it. Diego was going to die. Brogan aimed his gun just as Ellis dropped his shoulder to turn. Becca had no choice. She had to move. She yanked Ellis by the collar and jerked him back, keeping the man off balance and in front of her. Using his body as a shield, she pointed her gun at Brogan. It's going down. Move. Move. Brogan caught the sudden movement and turned his weapon on Becca. He fired. A deafening sound. Again and again. Ellis bucked in her hand as the bullets hit his chest. His convulsing body had become a liability, too heavy to hold up. She shoved him aside and took aim. Becca looked down Brogan's gun barrel with him in her sights. Take the shot. Take it. Draper's comm unit crackled to life. Sir, we're investigating a report of gunfire on a lower level. No telling how many rounds fired. He recognized the voice of his HRT leader, Martinez, and asked, Could it be our guys? We're still verifying our headcount, sir, but I sent a team to check out the disturbance. Anyone see Diego Galvin or Detective Rebecca Montgomery? Draper asked. Nothing so far, sir, but we're still accounting for the dead. We'll keep you posted. Out. Dead. The word gripped him hard, and he thought he didn't do guilt. Draper caught the eye of Lieutenant Santiago standing a few yards away. The man heard the last report and looked worried. And he had to admit, his stomach had been knotted from the beginning. He had taken liberties with the lives of two people still unaccounted for, and he knew it. And Draper had coerced Joe Rivera to gain an inside informer, but he'd gotten much more in Diego Galvin. He couldn't have expected any better from an agent. If anything happened to him, it would hurt like he had lost one of his own. Damn it. He torqued his jaw and peered through the mass of bodies going in and out of the scene. Each face got a second look, but so far, nothing. The operation shed its harried pace and settled into wrap-up mode with plenty for him to oversee. Spiraling lights from emergency vehicles and police squad cars streamed across the night sky and robbed the heavens of its stars. Urgent voices of medical crews and law enforcement personnel muted into background chatter in his mind. Yet when he needed to respond to his comm unit, he picked up on every word. Filtered hearing from controlled chaos, he liked to call it. And of course, an operation this size attracted the media, another reason for superior hearing filtration. He managed to rope off the news crews a couple of blocks away. Their camera lights might attract the wrong attention if one of the gunmen escaped. Keeping them at a distance had its benefits for now. When he was ready, there would be a press conference. Now he had other priorities. Up until a few minutes ago, he believed the underground facility had been secured. The wounded and dead were being carted out, and EMT units worked on the injured. The new gunfire added complications, but nothing his men couldn't handle. Thus far, all of the casualties had been Kavanaugh's men. His team had sustained injuries, but nothing life-threatening. Best of all, every one of the abducted girls had been rescued, and then some. A greater headcount than he had expected. 
The girls had been malnourished, dehydrated, and in need of medical attention. But overall, the operation had been a success. When Draper saw the hostages brought out one by one, he fought a gnarl in his throat the size of Rhode Island. Kavanaugh had been kidnapping young kids from Mexico and bringing them into the United States. He probably promised them work or simply took them like he had before, knowing the missing girls' parents would have no recourse across international borders. Nineteen girls in all, ranging in ages from ten to twenty-two. As a father, it gripped him in the worst way, hitting too close to home. No parent should have to endure such a nightmare. Daughters were precious gifts. He had been blessed with four. When he was a young father, he had yearned for a son to pass on his name, his futile and self-indulgent attempt at immortality. Time and experience changed his view. For him, a bond between father and child transcended gender, in theory. But the connection between a father and daughter had its own unique miracles. Seeing love reflected in his daughter's eyes, and knowing it was meant for only him, had fulfilled him in ways he hadn't expected. But with this tragedy, Draper imagined the horrifying ruin of these young lives. Gazing into the eyes of a broken child, your broken child, would have torn him in two. And bastards like Kavanaugh deserved hell on earth and beyond for their sins. Hey, Mike, you're gonna want to see this? Lieutenant Santiago punched him in the arm and pointed. Two patrol cars pulled up with lights flashing in silent mode. Draper walked with him to the vehicles and looked in the back seats. Each squad car held a single man. Well, I'll be damned. Who the hell is that guy? Draper didn't recognize the muscle man in the second car. And how did we score the top dog? I thought he might have slipped through our net or not been here at all. Draper bent down and glared at the man he'd been pursuing. Hunter Cavanaugh had never looked so good, handcuffed and riding in the back of a squad car. And the man sitting in the other vehicle looked scared enough to be a talker. The other guy's name is Stan McPhee. He's got a list of priors that should have him willing to talk. We thought it would be a good idea to keep them separated. I smell plea bargain for testimony, Santiago replied. But under the heading of living right, you're not going to believe the stroke of luck we got with Kavanaugh. Oh, this I gotta hear. I could use some good news. Seems one of our tactical teams secured a staging area in a condemned textile factory behind our target building. It gave us a good view of the backside of the facility. Santiago grinned, and he talked loud enough for Kavanaugh to hear from inside the squad car. The old man rolled his eyes and slunk down into the seat, his jaw clenched as the lieutenant continued. One of our guys found an abandoned vehicle inside, a rather pricey Lexus, only it's clean as a whistle and not looking so abandoned. In the course of carrying out their duties, the team staked out the car and waited. What started out as a fishing expedition landed us a whopper. The son of a bitch walked right into us, didn't even put up much of a fight. How did you get over there? Draper asked. Turns out these old buildings had tunnels under them. Most had been walled in as the owners took over the property. But there's evidence of new work done to install a coded hatchway at the facility where we nabbed Kavanaugh and McPhee. I bet we'll be able to trace who did the work and get them talking. Before Draper had to ask, the lieutenant added, We sent a team to investigate the one Kavanaugh came waltzing out of. Murphy will report when he has something. Draper shifted his gaze to Kavanaugh, staring through the side window. He opened the back door to the squad car and leaned in to get a better look at the man. Here's something I bet you'll agree with. You've had better days, right? Draper glared, not expecting an answer. What happened to Detective Rebecca Montgomery? Kavanaugh shifted in his seat and turned away. Draper thought the man would hang tough with the silent treatment, but the bastard wanted to twist the knife. Tragic, really. I saw her gunned down by one of your own men. When you find her body, an autopsy will prove my point. Draper took a deep breath and tried one more time. Where's Diego Galvin? The last time I saw him, he was breathing. Although you notice I used past tense. You see, I believe Diego suffered from an allergic reaction. A case of severe lead poisoning with extreme prejudice. Don't bet on him walking out of there alive. You'd lose. Something snapped inside him. Draper had no intention of being the object of Kavanaugh's amusement. Go ahead and have your fun, you cocky son of a bitch. He leaned into the squad car and whispered, If Calvin is dead, so are you. And I don't have to pull the trigger. His father will get to your ass even if I can't touch you. I'll personally deliver my version of the case details to Rivera. The smugness left Kavanaugh's face as fear slithered under the surface of his cool veneer, and Draper was only getting started. But there's one thing I can control. 
The system will be taking care of your room and board for a long time, but I'm personally going to see to your accommodations. Some lifer named Bruno will be salivating over your lily-white ass. Whoever said size didn't matter never met Bruno. Draper leaned closer, venom in his voice. Every time he bends you over, think of me, because I'll be the one sticking it to you. In this lifetime, it's only a fraction of what you owe those girls. To the cop behind the wheel, he said, get him out of my sight. Draper slammed the door on Kavanaugh, his heart hammering and stoked by red-hot anger as the patrol cars drove away. He pictured Diego dead, and Draper's gut snarled. He couldn't catch his breath, his frustration and anxiety mounting. When he turned around, Santiago opened his mouth to say something, but Draper didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want to be consoled, and he sure as hell didn't want to be reminded of his decision to delay the rescue mission. He walked back toward the old building and waited. With a renewed fixation, Mike Draper searched the faces of everyone coming and going out of the warehouse, but a man with a familiar gait caught his eye. He carried a teenage girl in his arms, and a woman walked alongside him. Draper couldn't confirm their identities for sure. Something blurred his eyes, but he knew enough to call Santiago over. Hey, Arturo, now I've got something you ought to see. The lieutenant rushed over, his eyes following where Draper pointed. The man squinted into the distance until he recognized his detective, Rebecca Montgomery. Then his face lit up like a friggin' Christmas tree. When he looked back at Draper, the lieutenant did a double take and nudged him with a shoulder. Allergies. My eyes water this time of year, too. Mainly when I go all gooey inside like a marshmallow and with my skin color, I look like a damn s'mores. Draper rolled his eyes and wiped a hand over his face, glaring at the man. You say anything about this and I swear, no, these lips are sealed. With a raised eyebrow, Santiago added, who would believe me anyway? Damn straight. Becca squinted into the floodlights, holding up a hand to shield her eyes. With cops and med techs rushing everywhere, she zeroed in on the ambulance units and headed for them. When she stepped out of the darkness and into the light, reality hit hard. She was a changed woman. Nothing would be the same again. And even though her body was racked with pain, her heart soared as she walked beside Diego, who held Danielle in his arms. Second chances had that kind of effect on a woman. She drew in a deep breath, remembering how she had felt hours before, convinced none of them would make it out alive. She'd also learned a thing or two about hope. Becca followed Diego to an ambulance. He carried her sister as if she were made of glass, and he kept whispering reassurances in Danny's ear. Becca only caught a few. His Hispanic accent sounded like a lovely melody that lingered in your heart long after it stopped playing. It's over, and you're safe, honey. Such a brave girl, he murmured. Rebecca never gave up on you, Danielle. She never lost hope of finding you. Mama, she whimpered. A tiny voice meant only for him. Danny clung to his neck, burrowing into his chest to hide her face from all the noise and commotion. He lowered his head to hers and held her close. Mama will see you at the hospital. He promised, your sister and I will pick her up on our way over, sweet girl. When they got to the ambulance, Diego lowered Danielle onto a gurney and covered her with warm blankets head to toe. EMTs wanted to step in right away, but he waved them off to give Becca a moment with her sister. Diego managed to smile when he looked over his shoulder at her. His face battered and bruised under the lights. Becca mouthed the words, thank you, knowing it would never be enough. She cradled Danny's face in her hands and kissed her forehead, drinking in the feel and smell of her skin. I'm going to take care of you for a while, little sister, for as long as you let me, she whispered. Danielle nodded, a tear rolling down her cheek as she clutched her hand. Becca turned to the lieutenant, squeezing his arm in gratitude, and as tears filled her eyes, she held her chin high and looked at Mike Draper. Mr. Draper, I'd like you to meet a survivor, Danielle Montgomery, my sister. Chapter 19 Santa Rosa Hospital, the next morning, 6.30 a.m. Becca jolted awake, her heart pumping adrenaline through her system, the cruelest of wake-up calls. Danielle's hospital room came into focus, along with the cramped chair she had fallen asleep in, but little else. Caught in the twilight between dreams and rational thought, her brain replayed what happened when she had killed for the first time. 
She shut her eyes tight and steadied her breathing, but the hospital room faded from her senses, and Becca couldn't stop her mind from summoning the dark account of last night. Drifting through murky shadows, she was alone again in the dark. Only the steady thud of her heart kept her company. Her memory of the stale, oppressive air in the garage overpowered the medicinal hospital odor, merging time and place as if she were back there, facing Brogan. It had all happened so fast at the time, but now it replayed over and over in gut-wrenching slow motion, every detail etched into her brain and branded her memory with crippling permanence. Becca saw his face again. She even smelled him. The nine-millimeter Glock kicked in her hands twice. Two rounds, center mass. Even now she felt it. Her fingers tingled, and the numbness radiated through her arms. Shots rang out, and the eerie echo punished her eardrums with a nasty, piercing ring. After the bullets hit his chest, Brogan staggered back and dropped to his knees, his chin sagging to his chest. In a last-ditch effort, he raised his head and glared at her, the old fire of contempt still burning in his eyes. She held her breath, waiting for him to take his last gasp. Fear gripped her heart like an icy fist, as if he'd get up one more time and finish the job he had started. But eventually, his face went slack, and the flicker of life died in his eyes, and so had Matt Brogan. He slumped to the floor, his skull cracking on the cement with a sickening thud. For a long time, she couldn't move, couldn't speak. Her eyes burned. She couldn't close them. Rooted in place, Becca watched the blood spread across his chest and seep onto the cement in a dark, thick pool. Diego rushed to her side, and she had been vaguely aware of his arms around her, but she couldn't take her eyes off him. Now Becca held back tears and forced the nightmare from her mind. She pressed cold, trembling hands to her face as if she could wipe it all away. The trauma of her close call with death had been the culmination of an exhausting siege to her psyche that had started with Danielle's abduction. She understood the consequences of the ordeal, but living through it was another story. A faint sound poked at the edges of her awareness, and a light pierced the dark. Slowly, she opened her eyes. The hospital room came back into focus, and she heard it again. Are you okay? A whisper. She turned toward the hospital bed and saw her sister. Becca? You okay? Danny asked again. She got up from her chair and stretched her back, walking toward the bed with a show of nonchalance she didn't feel. Becca still couldn't believe it. Danny was really here. Bruises mottled her sister's body, and the dark circles beneath her eyes made her pale skin look gray and pasty under the dimmed hospital lights. Yet the most startling change was in her eyes. The natural twinkle of youthful innocence had been stripped away. Haunted eyes stared back, made old before their time. The stark change in Danielle broke her heart. But Becca had another chance to do something about it and redeem herself with her family. Near the window, Mama lay curled up on a cot, fast asleep, the most content she'd seen her face in a very long time. Seeing her family together again, Becca wanted to pinch herself to make sure she was really awake. Go back to sleep. It's still early. She smiled and stroked her sister's hair, leaning over to kiss her forehead. You've been crying. Danny reached a hand to her cheek. Becca hadn't realized her tears showed on the outside. She wiped her face and took a breath. The cobwebs of her nightmare had crumbled but lurked under her skin. I'm okay, really. Nothing for you to worry about, Danny. Becca reassured her in a hushed tone, but a rush of emotion brought the tears back with a vengeance. I can't believe you're really here. Danny's blue eyes pulled and her lips trembled. Me too. She knew her sister. Danny couldn't talk about it. Not yet. Excuse me, Detective Montgomery. Becca turned to see a nurse standing at the doorway. Yes? I have a call for you at the nurse's station, she whispered. Detective Paul Murphy. He didn't want to disturb your family by ringing the room directly. Would you like the call forwarded here or... No, I'll take it out there. I'll be right behind you. Thanks. Becca turned back to Danny and shrugged. I've got to take this. I may be gone for a while, but I'll be back real soon, honey. You get some sleep, okay? With drowsy eyes, Danny lifted a corner of her mouth, a fleeting smile. Becca kissed her sister's cheek and walked out the door. She knew why Murphy had called so early. Last night, she'd asked for his help to close the Marquez case. Since it had been reassigned to him, Becca proposed they team up. But the paperwork would show it was all Murphy, 
a fair trade. In her mind, it didn't matter who got credit for the collar. Finding Isabel's killer had always been her greatest priority. And with the morning papers no doubt carrying the story of the warehouse siege, time would be critical. She didn't want her suspect to rabbit out of town. When she got to the station, the nurse gestured for her to take the white phone on the counter. Murphy, it's Becca. We've got your suspect Mirandized in custody. Interrogation room number three. No one in or out like you said. We'll be ready when you are. No lawyer? Not so far. Okay, I'm on my way. A fine line. It would come down to how well she walked one. Becca had nothing more than circumstantial evidence in her bag of tricks for a seven-year-old murder investigation. A necklace of dubious ownership found with the bones, contradictory interviews between potential suspects, and a dead man's version of the truth. She needed an undeniable confession that would hold up in court. Everything by the book. And yet she'd have to pull out all the stops to manipulate her suspect into admitting to murder. A tough sell. She opened the door to a room adjacent to interrogation room number three. In the dark stood Paul Murphy in a rumpled suit that looked like he'd slept in it. He probably had. The pale light coming through the two-way mirror in the next room outlined his silhouette. He glanced over as she entered, then shifted his focus back to the woman sitting at the interrogation table. Sonia Garza. Hey, Becca. We took her cigarettes and lighter, told her about the ban on smoking in the building. That pissed her off. She's been stewing for almost an hour. Apparently, she's not a morning person either. An early morning house call from the SAPD would tend to ruin your day. It looked like Sonia had thrown on whatever lay crumpled on her floor, or maybe she'd slept in her wrinkled white T-shirt and threw on jeans and an unzipped hooded sweat jacket to get out the door with an impatient Murphy. Either way, the dingy T-shirt made her skin appear washed out under the fluorescent lights. And without her usual dark-eyed makeup, she lost five years. Becca pictured the girl she'd been in high school. But most of all, Sonia lacked her usual edge. She picked at the chipped nail polish on her hands, looking bored. A complete contradiction to the fidgety, nervous behavior she tried to hide. Jaw flinching, anxious eyes unable to stay focused for long. And without her smokes, Becca imagined Sonia's skin crawled with the ants of her nicotine addiction. She looks pretty right. How do you want to play this? Sonia and I have a rapport from the times I've interviewed her, but she's lied to me, thinks she can do it again. I'm going to nail her this time. Becca shifted her gaze to Murphy. I need this interrogation to go off without a hitch, Paul. I've got less than zero on evidence, circumstantial at best. The DA will want more. I need a confession and it's got to be solid. How are we going to get it? She liked hearing Murphy use the word we, considering she had wanted to rearrange his face once, and he'd probably had similar sentiments. They had come a long way. Matt Brogan is going to help. The dead guy? Murphy stared at her as if she'd lost her mind. Maybe she had. Yeah, I have no intention of resurrecting the bastard, but he's going to make a brief comeback. Brogan will play his part in nailing Sonia one last time, and I suspect he'd appreciate the irony. Becca explained her game plan. Armed with little more than a heaping mound of horse hockey and nerve to match, she walked into the interrogation room with Murphy. Well, it's about time. I've been waiting over an hour. Sonia's eyes flared, her jaw tight. Yeah, sorry about that, but I'm sure we'll be able to wrap this up pretty quick with your cooperation. Becca sat across from Sonia and pointed a hand toward Murphy. I'm sure you've met. Yeah, yeah, detective muscle for brains. Cooperation on what? Murphy glared at the woman and stood with hands in his pants pockets. He liked to move around the room, forcing her to watch him. We have a few questions for you regarding Isabel Marquez. Detective Murphy has read you your rights. Do you want an attorney present during this interview? Sonia sagged into her chair, her eyes looking from Becca to Murphy. I got nothing to hide. No. I don't need a lawyer. Let's get this over with. It always amazed Becca how frequently suspects waived their rights to an attorney to appear as if they had nothing to hide. Nothing like cop shows on TV. Becca had counted on Sonia's doing just that, and she didn't disappoint. In a show of apathy, the woman pulled at a strand of her hair and inspected it for split ends, no doubt a poor substitute for a cigarette. All interrogation room interviews were videotaped and recorded to document the process and the treatment of the suspect, Special permission from the detainee was not required. Becca aimed to record irrefutable evidence to be used in court by the district attorney and avoid the pitfalls of making a contribution for the defense. After she asked Sonia a few questions to establish her relationship with the dead girl for the record, Becca hit her with the first nail in her coffin. She knew Sonia would lie straight up, the start of her slippery slope. When was the last time you saw Matt Brogan? The shocked and indignant expression on Sonia's face told Becca she had struck a chord, 
She gave her the opportunity to tell the truth, knowing the woman would choose a different path. Lying had become far too easy for Sonia, a weakness Becca hoped to capitalize on. You mean the guy that raped me? She flung both hands in the air and shook her head, a display of exasperation. Do you think I got him on my speed dial? I can't pinpoint the exact date. But the night he raped me would be close enough, wouldn't it? So approximately seven years ago. Is that correct? Becca leaned on the table, forcing Sonia to meet her eyes. Yeah. And you haven't seen him since that night? No, thank God. Like I told you before, people with money don't exactly travel in my social circle. Why? I thought this was about Isabel. Murphy walked behind Becca and caught Sonia's attention, a distraction from the woman's question. She returned his glare, her outward hostility toward him showing. The man who stole her smokes and woke her too damned early. Now he slouched against the wall with the two-way mirror, playing his head game and loving it. And you also said Isabel Marquez tried to recruit you into prostitution, to work for Matt Brogan. But you turned her down because you couldn't go through with it. Is that an accurate statement? Yeah, sure. She fidgeted in her seat and heaved a dramatic sigh, latching her eyes onto Murphy. What did you do with my smokes, man? I better get them back. They cost money. Smoking is banned in the building. We wouldn't want you to break any laws while you're here. He slathered on the sarcasm. Sonia rolled her eyes and sank into her chair, ignoring him again. Becca knew how tough a job that was. Look, I already told you all this, the young woman said. Yes, you did. And you also told me Isabel arranged for you to attend a party at the Kavanaugh estate around that same time. Can you tell me about it? Sonia regurgitated the same story she had told Becca before, nearly verbatim. So Matt Brogan insisted Isabel set you up. He raped you and allowed others at the party to do the same. Is that true? Yeah, Isabel set me up all right, and she left me there, with them. And even though you believed you were drugged, you remember enough of the incident to make this claim. You don't forget something like this, lady. I still get nightmares. Why do you think she did it? Because of Brogan. He's a mean son of a bitch. When he wants something, he gets it. And he wanted you. Becca didn't bother to attach a question to her statement, knowing Sonia couldn't resist elaborating. Yeah, he wanted me all right. He wanted what he couldn't have otherwise. Guys like that don't take no for an answer. I found out the hard way. How did Isabel feel about Brogan's interest in you? Did she ever act jealous? Sonia raised her voice and clenched her fists on the table until her knuckles went white. She hated it. The bastard never got enough. For him, an innocent young girl had a target on her back. Fair game and open season year round. Isabel despised him for it, but she was too weak to say no and walk away. For whatever reason, she needed him like an addict needs a fix. Running with a guy like that, she was bound to get into trouble. A glimpse of personal truth. Becca knew with the right questions centered on Sonia's feelings for Brogan, the woman might project her own emotion onto Isabel, a coy game. She liked to dangle a bit of truth in front of Becca, her pattern of lying, and he was the one who bought her the expensive gold necklace, the one with a pendant shaped like a heart with diamonds on it. Isabel told you Brogan bought it for her, right? Yeah, she did. She bragged about it, in fact. Tried to tell me if I worked for him, I could have the same things, like it would be enough. Sonia leaned her elbows onto the table, her eyes fixed on Becca. You know, you really should be talking to Brogan about all this. But you promised to keep my name out of it. He'd kill me if he knew. You won't tell him, will you? No, he won't be hearing it from me. Becca raised an eyebrow and crossed her arms. Behind her, Murphy cleared his throat and shuffled his feet. Because I think the son of a bitch killed Isabel and dumped the body where no one would find it. She knew too much. I don't know how or where he did it, but I got a gut feeling he's behind it. Sonia narrowed her eyes. Hey, why all the questions about Matt Brogan? Sounds like you believe me. He's a sick, twisted guy. No more twisted than a woman who arranges a rendezvous with the bastard who raped her seven years ago. A little mattress mambo at a flea bag motel off Guadalupe Street sounds like more than just talk. It sounds like a history of lies and cover-ups. Sonia's eyes grew wide, and her mouth opened. Her face twitched with a nervous tick of her lips. Murphy turned a chair around next to Sonia and straddled it, his elbows on the backrest. Maybe you got a different definition of hard feelings. Sounds real cozy to me. You see where I'm coming from, Sonia? Becca gestured with her hands. Matt Brogan is hard to shut up once he gets going, especially when he's got a different version of the truth. And you lying to Murphy and me is proof enough you're hiding something. You've already lied about how well you knew the man who allegedly raped you. Hell, for all we know, you've got him on your Christmas card list. 
That makes no sense if what you said is true. He didn't rape you. He told you that? And a lot more. Care to revise any of your previous statements? Becca asked. Matt's here? God, is he pissed? He's been better. Becca cocked her head to one side. A panicked look spread across Sonia's face. If he knows I said anything, he'll kill me. You should have thought about that before you lied to me and implicated him. Implying a dead guy was alive and kicking wouldn't play too well with the church crowd, but police used all sorts of tactics to get a confession, part of the fine line Becca walked. This session would be recorded and used in court. If the defense screamed foul, they would be opening a nasty can of worms about Sonia's relationship to Brogan, allowing the prosecution to pick at an old festering wound in front of a jury. It wouldn't be worth the risk. Sonia raked fingers through her hair, then clasped her hands to the back of her neck. She looked deep in thought, considering her options and taking a stroll through her maze of lies. The woman released her grip and let her arms land on the table with a thump. You lied about the necklace, too. Becca rocked forward on the edge of her seat and watched the color drain from Sonia's face. Brogan said so, and considering he's the one who allegedly bought the thing, according to you, that's another strike against your version of reality. The guy's got a pretty healthy ego, but with your track record of lying, I'd say he's the odds-on favorite to pull ahead in the stretch. And as for him raping you, he said he never needed to. You were all over him. The rape happened, I swear. For the first time, a tear rolled down Sonia's cheek. Before yesterday, Becca might have believed she'd been capable of remorse, but not today. Oh, Matt had plenty to say about the rape. He told you? Sonia asked, shock on her face. She winced and wrapped her arms over her chest and rocked back and forth. After a long moment, she opened up. He forced me to get Isabel to the party. You don't know what he's like. You knew Isabel would be raped. You could have said no. Not to Brogan. Her eyes glazed over. Isabel was the party. Him and his friends were waiting for us to get there. Isabel to get there. I slipped something into her drink, thinking it would make it easier for her to take it. And maybe she wouldn't know I had anything to do with what happened. But Brogan screwed that up, too. He kept her after the party for his men. No drugs. More tears. But Becca got the feeling these tasted bitter with regret. More from getting caught than any real remorse. He made me watch, you know. Sonia grimaced and her lips trembled. Matt the guys at the party, and his men after. The bastard made me watch it all. I thought I loved him once, but you don't love a guy like him. He's a user. Becca had a sudden appreciation for Sonia and Brogan's mutual attraction, but her heart ached for Isabel Marquez, the innocent girl caught in the middle. Her only fault was being a poor judge of character, and despite Rudy and Victor's efforts to protect their sister, the brothers couldn't be everywhere at once. At some point, they had to let go and hope Isabel would be safe and make the right choices. But that didn't happen, and Becca had a taste of how they must have felt after their worst imaginings had been trumped by the reality of her murder. What did she do? Threaten to go to the cops? Not at first. I almost convinced her to forget it. I told her no one would believe her against rich guys like that. And she had no real proof it even happened. So much time had passed, but I guess it ate away at her. Because after the argument she had with her brother Rudy, things changed. So you killed her. Sonia shut her eyes and drew a frazzled breath. It's just that Isabel was going to ruin everything. I couldn't let that happen. Silence. She clenched her teeth and stared off into space. Isabel was going to tell the police about her rape. Tell me what happened. After her brother left the theater, she started talking about what happened at that fucking party right in the open. The workers took off after all the shouting, but anyone could have heard her if they walked back in. She didn't care. Her brother Rudy got her all upset. Isabel never told him what happened, but she thought if she told the cops, it would be like confession and wipe her slate clean somehow. God would forgive her. She could be so stupid like that. Becca tightened her jaw after Sonia called Isabel stupid for wanting to do the right thing, trivializing rape as if it were a silly parking ticket. But she needed to keep her talking and resisted the urge to let her own emotions show. She was going to blow the whistle, and you couldn't let her do that. Exactly. I had no choice. I kept thinking about how I'd be arrested and do jail time. Even if I could live with that, Matt would have been arrested, with his party guests dragged into it, a big mess. He had a lot more at stake. Just like now, I'd be better off in jail away from him, and it sounds like he's heading the same direction. Good for me. So she was protecting Brogan. Yeah, right, Becca thought. And oh, what a difference seven years makes. Now she couldn't care less if he's put in jail. Sonia's smoke and mirrors were completely transparent now. 
How could she have been so blind to her lies? Becca resisted the urge to glance at Murphy. If Sonia had found out about Brogan being dead, this interrogation would have been over before it began. Tell me what happened, Becca prompted. Sonia heaved a sigh, her eyes engrossed in her memory. I stood in her way, shoving her, but she wouldn't back down. When Isabel slapped me, I lost it, the bitch. She didn't care what would happen to me. I grabbed the first thing I found, some kind of hammer, and I hit her over the head with it. There was so much blood. She cried. Her sobs echoed in the room until a lumbering silence took over. Becca narrowed her eyes and caught Murphy's eye. He gave a slight nod, letting her know he thought the same as she did. Becca had gotten what she wanted, a solid confession. But it left her empty knowing Isabel's life had meant so little to Sonia Garza. A pawn in her sex play with Matt Brogan. Becca kept her composure and moved on. What did you do then? Sonia wiped her cheeks with the sleeve of her sweat jacket, choking on her words. I panicked. Didn't know what to do. I shut all the doors and locked them so no one could come in. The blood, I couldn't. I called Matt using my cell and waited. Just when Becca thought there would be no more twist to Sonia's story, the woman zinged a curveball over home plate, but Becca couldn't afford to react. If Brogan were alive and partial to talking, he would have mentioned something as trivial as disposing of a corpse. Only Isabel hadn't been dead after Sonia struck her. She had been alive, unconscious, but alive. Sonia waited for Brogan while Isabel's heart beat in her chest, a faint pulse. The outcome would have been the same, but the callousness of the crime made her sick. Becca thought the knot wedged in her throat. Tell me your version of the story. Sonia shrugged with depraved indifference. I can't believe I had to convince that son of a bitch to help me. I would have done much more for him. More than murder? Becca shook with anger, but held it in. Finally, Sonia looked up and raised her chin. You'll find Isabel buried in the old theater, to the right of the stage behind a brick wall. She's been there all along. Brogan bricked the body in the wall with the cement and equipment left behind, and he had Kavanaugh suspend the renovation for a while to make sure no one would notice the smell and the finished wall. From what Matt said, he never told Kavanaugh what happened, but the old man did him a favor, no questions asked. Out of the blue, Sonia laughed, a cold-hearted, hollow sound. Matt dumped me after that, threatened me with a knife to stay away. But knowing what I did and where the body was buried had been his insurance I'd do what he said. Since he helped me, guess the insurance worked both ways. Becca couldn't hide her reaction this time. Sonia confessed to killing a friend and reduced the murder to nothing more than a catalyst to a breakup with her boyfriend. Unbelievable. Sonia Garza, you are under arrest for the murder of Isabel Marquez. In your own handwriting, I want you to make a statement telling what happened to Isabel, then sign and date it. She shoved a notepad across the table, along with a pen. Becca would wait until she had a written confession and a signature before telling her Isabel had been alive when Brogan bricked the girl in the wall. For most people, that knowledge would make a difference on the guilt barometer, but in this case, Becca suspected the news would have little significance, no more concern than a fender bender in a rental car. Sonia wrote a few lines and stopped. She looked up at Becca and asked, Can I have a cigarette now? The cold, dead eyes of a killer stared back, no remorse in sight. Chapter 20 Two weeks later, this time, Becca had taken a real vacation, taking the first steps to mend her soul. Danielle spent a couple of days in the hospital but was eager to come home. Mama insisted both her girls live under one roof for a while. How could Becca refuse? The gesture touched her heart, along with her mother's willingness to join her and Danielle in therapy. Danny wouldn't be alone on her road to recovery. And today, another milestone had been realized, a bittersweet one. Isabel Marquez had come home too. Over a week ago, a positive ID had been made using the family's DNA, and the bones had been released for burial. Although today's memorial had been a private affair, only a few close friends and family, Diego had pulled strings to make the day solemn for the Marquez family. And in his mind, only one church would do. On Main Plaza in downtown San Antonio, the San Fernando Cathedral had the honor of being the first parish in Texas. Its construction completed in 1755, the historic site was the crown jewel of the old Spanish missions, with an elaborate stone facade, ornate stained glass, an impressive pipe organ, and a hand-carved stone baptismal font. Pope John Paul had blessed the church with one of his visits, 
and politicians, ambassadors, and governors had become a part of the cathedral's distinctive history. Diego had insisted Isabel deserved nothing less, and he spared no expense, paying for all the arrangements of the tasteful service. Angelic voices of a small choir heralded the passing of a life cut short. Incense and the aroma of flowers filled the air, along with a sense of relief that the Marquez girl would finally be put to rest, a moving and solemn memorial service, no less extraordinary than Isabel's brief life. Now the meager funeral procession pulled into the San Fernando Cemetery on Castroville Road, not far from the Marquez home. Across a piercing blue sky, faint wisps of clouds graced the horizon, and the sun reflected off the glittery offerings left at other grave markers. To honor the dead, tinsel and baubles danced and fluttered in the breeze. A sea of loving mementos, the striking image never failed to touch Becca. Whole families often spent Sunday afternoons at the cemetery, bringing small children and picnic lunches, a celebration of the lives that came before. Here the dearly departed were never truly forgotten. Becca parked on the edge of grass and got out of her car. Danielle and Mama had come along, sensing the importance of this day for Becca. Her mother and sister clung to each other now, standing under the dark green awning, and Isabel's shiny copper casket was covered in lilies and white blush roses, innocence lost. On one side of the grave, a solemn-faced mariachi quartet waited to strike the first note, another part of the culture Becca had grown to respect. Diego hadn't forgotten a single detail. He stood at her side, holding her hand, and as Father Victor Marquez began a graveside tribute to his sister, Isabel, Becca leaned her head against Diego's shoulder. He drew her close, a welcomed intimacy, and she took advantage of his warmth. She nuzzled her arms around his waist with eyes shut tight, fighting back a sudden rush of tears. As Becca breathed in the heady aroma of flowers, the rich smell of overturned earth, and Diego's subtle cologne on the breeze, a wave of peace swept over her, a fragile stillness. It would take time for her to feel worthy of happiness, but now she had hope the day would come. It was a beautiful service, Father Victor. Becca made a point to speak to the priest in private, away from the crowd hovering near Isabel's grave. Diego Galvan had much more to do with that. The cleric insisted, my mother will never forget this day. Isabel's life honored at the San Fernando Cathedral. You have no idea what it meant to her, and to Rudy and me. We can never repay Diego's generosity. And he wouldn't expect anything in return. I have gotten to know his quiet ways. Father Victor smiled, warm and genuine. Yes, I can see that. When she returned his gesture with heat coloring her cheeks, the priest added, you have a look of contentment about you. I can see it in your eyes. Different from the woman who came to my family's home a lifetime ago. Not many people get a chance to do things over again. Becca gazed over her shoulder at Danielle and her mother, talking to Diego in the warm sun. I've been blessed. Yes, I read about your sister in the newspaper. Just like our Isabel finally coming home. You experienced a miracle of your own. Yes, a miracle. She hadn't thought of it that way until now. An amazing blessing. It puzzled Becca to hear that Father Victor considered the return of Isabel's body to be a miracle for his family. She supposed time and dashed hopes had convinced him that his sister would not walk through their front door. His mother would never embrace her daughter again. His brother Rudy would not experience the privilege of asking a sister's forgiveness, and he would not play the part of older brother to guide her, protect her, save her. Isabel's burial and the peace of mind of his family were all Victor had left. Perhaps miracles were still miracles, no matter what the size. You were at the Imperial Theater the morning after the fire, weren't you, Father? She asked, squinting into the sun. The arson part of her investigation still remained open. Her question, out of the blue, surprised him. But a look of resignation on his face told her she would hear the truth. Finally. How could he bend it standing next to Isabel's grave? After all, his sister had been the reason for the priest's subterfuge. He had no more reason to lie now, except one. Yes, I was. He looked away and took a deep breath, waiting for her to go on. You set the arson fire hoping Isabel would be found. And I'm sorry. Sorry we couldn't find Isabel without your help. But you had another reason to put up roadblocks whenever I questioned you. He nodded, his face grimacing with the memory. You were protecting Rudy, weren't you? She locked eyes with Father Victor. The look of shock on his face wrenched her heart. 
She shifted her attention to Rudy Marquez, standing among the mourners. The young man looked lost even in a crowd. Please don't make me answer that question, Rebecca. I don't want God to hear those words coming from my mouth. His lips trembled as a single tear drained down his cheek. Please, hear me out. I know about the fight Rudy had with Isabel at the theater on the day she went missing. I think you knew about it, too. That's why you thought he needed your protection. Father Victor shut his eyes tight, his mouth moving in a silent prayer, a priest trapped in his own brand of hell on earth. She had to set things right. Don't worry, Victor. Rudy won't hear about it from me, but he does need your help whether he admits it or not. Your brother will always carry the burden of his guilt, because he can't rectify it. Not now. She reached for the cleric's arm and squeezed it. I'll get a chance to fix things with Danielle and my mother. It's up to me now to make a difference. But Rudy won't ever get that opportunity. He needs you more than he would ever say. Don't let him ride this out alone. I know how that feels. I understand. I'll do what I can. I've asked to be relocated to San Antonio to be with my family. I owe my brother that much. He's a good man. But Isabel's loss has taken a toll on him. On us all. A sadness darkened his face. I still can't believe what happened. Sonia had been Isabel's friend. No, father. She never really was. Becca took a deep breath. I don't want to ruin today. But you and I should talk about the details of this case before it goes to trial. You'll have to prepare your family for what they may hear. But I want you to know Isabel was a good girl. She tried to do the right thing, and she loved her family very much. Never doubt the Isabel you honored and cherished. She's someone I would have been proud to call a friend. Father Victor's face softened into a show of relief, a long-awaited release of his burden. His tears were for a different reason now, and as far as the Imperial Theater arson case went, the priest would not be charged. Becca had only her suspicions and no hard evidence. Not enough to make a case. The Marquez family had suffered enough. Thank you, Rebecca. May the Lord bless you on your journey. He raised his hand and made the sign of the cross. He already has, Father Victor. But a good word from you can't hurt. She smiled. Take care of your family. Let them mourn. Help them heal. And I'll call you soon. But first, I'd like you to meet my family. As she introduced Danielle and her mother to Father Victor, Becca's mind drifted to Sonia. During the course of her investigation, she had always had a blind spot when it came to her. She wanted to believe her lies because to comprehend what really happened was darker than Becca wanted the world to be. In the end, Sonia confessed because she thought Brogan was alive and would refute her story, big time. A major finger-pointing session with her coming out on the losing end, and she thought by serving jail time, she might avoid the man's revenge for her betrayal, a strong motivator. But being dead was a powerful hurdle to overcome, even for Matt Brogan. When Sonia found out what happened to him, she stuck with her confession, something Becca hadn't expected. She wanted to believe guilt played a mean game of devil's advocate and persuaded the woman to own up to her crime, but Becca had grown far too cynical to buy it. Sonia had been a willing participant in her own destruction. No repentance required. Maybe jail would be a step up to the life she had lived, and the little gold necklace with the heart? Sonia bought it for herself. She gave the name of the jeweler, and their records were pulled from archives, giving police another piece of the puzzle. It turned out Matt Brogan wasn't the romantic type after all. Imagine that. In the fight with Isabel, the necklace was torn off Sonia's neck. Her CSI guy, Sam Hastings, confirmed the chain had been broken, one of the reasons it wasn't found dangling from the neck of Isabel's skeleton, but lying on the ground. So much of Sonia's story evolved around Matt Brogan, but he was probably only an excuse, an accelerant to her self-immolation. She had made contact with him again, hoping for a spark of what they'd had before. But when she realized that door had been shut for good, she accused him of Isabel's murder to get the monkey off her back once and for all. She thought the police would buy it. After all, Brogan fit the killer mold far better than Sonia, the consummate actress. But the bastard was dead. He got off light. Was Sonia a cold-hearted killer and a pathological liar, or a sick, broken girl? It wasn't Becca's place to say. The justice system and court-appointed psychiatrists would determine that. The insanity plea was a tough uphill battle in the state of Texas. All Becca wanted was to set the record straight on the life of Isabel Marquez. A higher power would sort out the rest. The Riverwalk, 
downtown San Antonio, 10 p.m. During the time she stayed with her mother and Danny, Becca let Diego stay at her place. He had to give up his posh digs at the Kavanaugh estate, a hardship he embraced with open arms. Becca hadn't realized how much he hated living there, even when the arrogant Kavanaugh wasn't around. Diego preferred a simpler existence, and living at her small condo on the river was as basic as life got. Standing in her kitchen, Becca poured Diego a refill on his wine. She had insisted on cooking dinner for him this time. The Chardonnay reflected golden light onto the counter, shimmering from the crackling fire in her hearth. She breathed a sigh and gazed across the room. He looked at home sitting on her sofa, a sight she could get used to. Dressed in jeans and a soft flannel shirt, he looked comfortable. A new side to him she wanted to know better. His shirt felt warm and inviting to the touch, but not as good as skin on skin. Seeing his handsome face reflecting the warm flicker of the fire stirred her libido, but first things first, she had a point to make. You brought a knife to a gunfight, Diego. Becca handed him the wine glass and scrunched in close, nuzzling into the warmth of his chest. Next time you might consider a better plan. Next time? He laughed out loud, a sound Becca would never tire of hearing. But Diego's smile quickly faded, dimples and all. I don't want to even think about you going through that again. He stroked her hair, his dark eyes conveying what she knew he held in his heart. Look, I get it. You don't want to talk about it, he said, understanding her use of humor as a shield to protect her tender underbelly. But you took a risk coming after me the way you did, Rebecca. I figured if Danny had been rescued by Draper's guys, then she was already safe. If not, she'd need both of us. I like the sound of that. Us. Even with her eyes mesmerized by the fire, she heard the subtle smile in his voice. So do I. Her crooked grin faded, nudged out by the knot in her throat. And it did take the two of us. You risked your life to protect Danielle. It scares me to think how close Brogan came to killing her. And you. I still have nightmares, but I won't ever forget what you did. She breathed a sigh and laid her head on his chest, holding him close. Maybe they did need to talk. Closure was important. No more than you did for me. I had no choice, really. If anything would have happened to you or Danielle, living with that pain for the rest of my days would have been no life at all. And I'm done with merely existing in a fog. I have to reclaim my life, take it back. Oh, yeah, I hear that. Becca rose and looked into Diego's eyes, taking a chance she might get lost in them, for days, weeks even. But a lingering thought ruined the moment. I guess Joe Rivera is eager to get you home. She'd hoped to sound casual. You've been gone a long time. Yeah, he's. I'm leaving the day after tomorrow, he said. Becca couldn't help it. She couldn't hide her shock. The news gripped her heart like a vice. But when Diego saw her strong reaction, he smiled with a tenderness she had grown to love. Just to pack my things and have a few days with my father. I'll be gone a week, but I'm coming back home. To you. My life is here with you, Rebecca. She replayed his words in her head over and over before she understood what he meant. Diego had made a place for her in his future, and she couldn't imagine a life without him in it. The ticking clock in her head unwound, releasing the sense she might wake up tomorrow and he'd be gone. Diego was coming back, to her, and they had all the time in the world. And I think I've been waiting for you to begin living mine. Her eyes blurred with tears. Diego pulled her to him his lips pressed to hers, with the ambrosial taste of Chardonnay on his tongue. She felt the arousal of his body, his hunger for her. Yet he cradled her face in his hands with such gentleness. She never felt so loved, so cherished. When she burrowed into his arms once more, resting her cheek against his shoulder, Becca remembered the first time Diego kissed her. You know, I started our relationship with blackmail. Who says crime doesn't pay? She hugged him tight, listening to the deep and soothing rumble of laughter in his chest. Breathing in the seductive smell of his skin, Becca looked out her window. She watched the cypress trees dance under the colorful lights off the river walk, stirred by a winter breeze. She always wanted to remember this moment, when she knew her heart belonged to him. I love you, Diego. He kissed the top of her head and pulled her close. What took you so long, sweet Rebecca?
This concludes the reading of No One Heard Her Scream by Jordan Dane. Copyright 2008 by Cosas Finas, LLC. This book was read by Marguerite Gavin. This unabridged recording was published by arrangement with HarperCollins Publishers and was produced in 2008 by Blackstone Audio Incorporated, which holds the copyright. Neither this recording nor any portion of it may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authorization from Blackstone Audio Incorporated. If you would like to obtain a complete catalog of our titles or our monthly update telling you about new releases and our new collection of books on CD and MP3 CD, call 1-800-SAY-BOOK. That's 1-800-729-2665. You may also obtain the same information from our award-winning website. Our address, all one word, is www.blackstoneaudio.com. Thank you.